make sure there are no interruptions. An historic moment when you think about it. The President of the United States uh, coming to Rochester. Is this we'll hear a lot of opinions, people endorsing his plan, people opposed to the plan. We will share with you the protesters who are here. Uh, but that almost can wait in a way when you think about it. The fact that the, the sitting president of the United States is here, and that hasn't happened in, in uh, quite a while as Air Force One taxis in. Doug Ambush has been out at the airport uh, throughout this morning. Jenny is standing by over at Greece Athena as uh, yep. we prepare to, to welcome. Doug, I think you can hear me now. I hear you in the background. Yeah, I sure do, Don. Uh, we're drowned out a little bit by Air Force One, which is about... Uh, Oh, I don't know, 40 yards from us, right? You see our camera position. I'm here with Kristen Miranda, who has spent the last few days out at the airport uh, covering the preparations for this, both security-wise and the logistics of handling uh, regular airplane passengers. Kristen noticed just a few minutes ago, maybe about 10 minutes ago, that uh, airspace seemed very quiet and that we kind of theorized that the uh, no-fly zone was in effect. When does that start? About 15 minutes before touchdown, Kristen? It's about a 20-minute uh, no-fly zone right around the time Air Force One does come into Rochester and also leaves Rochester. They have to make sure zero commercial flights are in the air to make sure it's completely safe for the president to land. So those folks who were concerned about delays, as you were reporting for the last few days, this is when the delays would take effect and then again when the president gets ready to leave Rochester and go back to Washington. This is exactly when they were talking about mid-morning and then right around noontime, but they were hoping to minimize those delays to about 20, 30, or 40 minutes. And they've talked with the airlines to make sure people can get to their connections all right. A little bit about the history, Don, of this airplane. It is a 747, one of two that was delivered by Boeing back in 1990 to replace the 707 that served for nearly 30 years. Boeing has actually been carrying U.S. presidents in some form or another since 1943. A little trivia for you, the first flight of a president on a Boeing uh, plane was in 1943 when FDR flew to Casablanca. In 1962, during the Kennedy administration, uh, Air Force One got its radio name. In other words, that's when they started referring to this plane as Air Force One. You can see the door is open now as they move the jetway out there. Uh, Air Force One is not technically a specific plane. It is simply a radio designation for whatever plane the president is on. That Air Force One that was delivered to uh, JFK was the first jet. Some of the folks that are here to greet the uh, president today, Governor Pataki, Maggie Brooks is here as well, um, John Auberger, the supervisor of Greece, Sheriff O'Flynn, local businessman David Flom, a supporter of the president's. Also, George Ann Schaffel, the local woman who is a literacy volunteer and will be honored by the president today. Also in that line is Cheryl Dinolfo, the Monroe County clerk. I think I said Maggie Brooks. Um, and there's the governor really at the head of the line there that you see. Doug, that, that presentation uh, for George Ann is going to be made at the airport, correct? It will be done right here, Don, actually. Uh -huh. They said that they were going to uh, have the presentation here, and then she will be going over to Greece Athena as well to hear the president speak. I've waited in the past for presidents to get off of Air Force One, Don, either here or in Buffalo or in Syracuse, and that's always really, for the folks covering at the airport, the big moment. How long will it be till he steps yeah. to the, the doorway you see there and comes down those stairs? You can see there are two limos in place. Uh, one of them will take President Bush, as you said, to uh, Greece Athena, and there's the President of the United States in Rochester. Right, let's take a moment and just look at this and savor the moment. Coming out all alone, Air Force One for the yeah. moment. Uh, to greet the, I want to see who's the first, the, the first hand that he shakes. Will that be the governor, do you think? Or? I think the governor. There's the governor, there John. The woman with the governor in the right next to the governor is in pink. I don't know if you can see her from this camera la camera angle. That is uh, uh, the woman who is the president of the Genesee County Legislature. Tom Reynolds, I see there greeting uh, both of the governors. Tom must have been on the plane this morning. He came down. Yes, and there's Randy Cool as well, who is on the plane. A chance for the president to maybe wield some influence with the local members of Congress, hoping to get their support for his social security plan. I see Jim Walsh uh, right behind there too in line. A lot, of, a lot of speculation that that is really part of this uh, trip, not necessarily only to, uh, to win over the public, but to win over the support of those three Republican uh, lawmakers who represent a good portion of this. The last time, the last time George Bush was here, Don, was uh, during his first campaign for president, as I recall, mm -hmm. and that was a stopover at Hillside Children's Center. 
uh, came here for a very brief campaign stop. And to my recollection, that was the last time uh, George W. Bush yep. was, was, was in our town. A lot of people to, uh, to greet and uh, a lot of military presence there as well as we share the pictures from the airport. He is, is really making an effort to, uh, to greet almost everyone in sight. And, and that was the greet, Don. You just saw it happen. The president has already moved into a limousine and some of these other folks are, uh, are, uh, who were flew with him and were there to greet him are already being shuffled out and uh, they may become, it looks like they will become part of the motorcade now. Kristen, you were here yesterday when these uh, this this whole line of cars and vehicles came off of that uh, military transport plane, that cargo plane that's still sitting on the runway now. A lot of equipment comes with the president. A lot of equipment. We were surprised that that plane came in just after noon. D Doug, if I could just interrupt you and Chris, it looks as though, is this George Ann? That is George Ann Shoffle, Don. Thank okay. you. We, we turn to our monitor now and we see what you are seeing. Yeah, we didn't I, before. I believe he's making that presentation for the volunteer, the Literacy Volunteer Award right now. That is what it is. Well, maybe the decoy got into the limousine already. <laughs> and, and certainly has fooled a few people out of the airport, I think. He, he pulled a fast one on me, actually turned around. <laughs> there were a lot of men with, uh, with salt and pepper hair and dark suits, Don, and I got fooled there. But now he has stepped into the limo. He did that. You saw that presentation lasted, uh, uh, oh, a minute or so for, for the, the lady from Rochester. And again, this equipment that has been uh, in Rochester for a day is about to do what it was brought here to do. I was surprised, and Kristen, maybe you want to pick up again on this. I was sure. surprised last night that we had... Mike Dory was out there. We really uh, had access to take pictures of this and, uh, and share the, the limousines that had arrived in advance. Rest assured, though, Don, those, those vehicles were well protected while they were in the uh, hangar here at U.S. airports. I would say it took maybe 20 minutes to half an hour to unload that military plane yesterday and get all of these vehicles off that plane. We just kept seeing vehicle after vehicle come out of the plane. We couldn't believe it could fit so many things inside. But uh, the Secret Service has not left those vehicles alone for a second while they've been here. Maybe we're noting, Don, that uh, leading the way on this motorcade was a Monroe County Sheriff's Department uh, red and white and a Greece police car leading the way. Uh, they know the way to Greece Athena, although my sense is the social, the Secret Service knows the way to Greece Athena pretty well, too. I wonder if we're going to see like a little shell game now where those limos will swap places so you never really know which one is uh, carrying the president until he gets out to Greece. One thing that, that always strikes me about these Secret Service details is, and I always notice that, in one of the SUVs are a couple of Secret Service agents sitting backwards with an open window. Uh -huh. uh, so I assume to be more in tune with what's happening around them and you know, as we've seen in the past, I think, ready to jump out and be alongside the president's vehicle if for any reason they need to be. This is quite an entourage that uh, is taking up. I was curious, too, and there's probably no way to know this. The people that service that plane when it lands, put the blocks under the wheels and, and secure it if they bring in people for that, or is that a, a local honor for some people that uh, work at the airport every day? That's a, a good question, Don. I don't know if the Air Force One crew is is the ones who actually takes... I know there are, there are folks who are the Air Force One crew who will be with this plane for the next couple of hours. I also know that the Secret Service has a Western New York detail that did a lot of the prep work, and then there's the detail that travels with the president. Kristen knows a little bit more about that. Talking to Terry Slaybaugh, the director of the Rochester Airport yesterday, he said that the Secret Service and the folks that, that deal with the Air Force One bring with them absolutely everything that they will need. They don't want any surprises when they get to a certain location. Mm -hmm. So everything that they need comes with them, even equipment that they had to borrow, for example, um, equipment to get the president off the plane because this is such a large... ...that arrives, and uh, it's a stunning venue, I think, uh, uh, not simply politically, but also artistically to welcome the uh, most powerful man in the world. And everybody here is eagerly anticipating the president. Again, as you're looking around the auditorium here, uh, some last-minute people being seated. In fact, it, right now it's a standing room only crowd, but security very tight. Now, Kurt, uh, 16 years ago in one week, uh, the president's father visited. Yes. Uh, again, can you tell me, what do you remember about that speech that you wrote for him to give? Well, I remember Air Force One, you were asking me about that, and uh, the fact that there are cots, that meals are served, that even then you had secure communication to literally any place in the world. This is actually the president, uh, President George Bush in town yes. 16 years ago. I remember uh, the feeling that any writer feels when he hears the words of the president of the United States, which is uh, a sensation that I think uh, any writer does not have equal. I remember just the, uh, the grace and courtesy of uh, the president's father. 
father and what a class act he was and, and is. And I remember the very warm reception that he got. Uh, Rochester been named by Reader's Digest, the friendliest city in the United States, and I think Kevin had showed it that day and doubtless will today as well. That visit, he was known as the education That's president. Correct. He went to Wilson Magnet High School. Yes. Did you uh, put an emphasis on education that day? Oh, sure. And, and again, this was uh, a, a seamless transition from the campaign. He had campaigned in 1988. His first priority was to be the education president. So he had a number of events that spring revolving around education, much like his son has had over the last three months in terms of Social Security. The difference, at least politically until now, the president in 1989 found great receptivity, Democrats and Republicans. This president, as of yet, has not found that kind of response. After you write a speech for the president, you get back on Air Force One, do you, do you get a good job or is there or is, is no news good news? Well, if they offer you a drink, uh, you generally know that things have gone well and two perhaps even better. But yes, you know, and the best way is simply how many applause lines. Writers, trust me, will yeah. sit and count. <laughs> Well, we'll be counting this morning. Kurt Smith, I'm here with Dave McKinley and Katrina Irwin. We're at the Grace Athena Performing Arts Center waiting for the arrival of President Bush. But now let's go back to the Channel 8 studios in Maureen McGuire. Maureen? Uh, all right, Kevin, and we will be right back with our special coverage in just a moment. Stay right there. Here's a quick and easy tip for help. You'll see how. And when it came time to pay the claim? Like that, without a hassle. They paid it. And it was like they were happy to give me the money. Does your insurance company do that? We also have one of the highest retention rates in the industry. I've had a Mika for years. Five years. 25 years. Never a hassle. You don't have a Mika? Find out what everyone's talking about. Switch to the insurance company that understands it's not just how you're covered. I just pick up the phone and call. It's how you're treated. You gotta get a Mika. Get a Mika, bro. Call a Mika. Call a Mika today for a free, no obligation quote. You're watching News 8 Now, continuing coverage of a presidential visit. Welcome back, everyone. The president is now in Rochester. His motorcade is on its way to Greece Athena High School at this moment. And let's take it to Greece Athena High School, where Kevin Doran and Katrina Irwin are standing by. What a day. A lot of excitement there. That is a big, beautiful, brand new auditorium with a very packed oh. audience. And it, it's, it's the perfect place to hold an event like this. And, and this has been the buzz of this school. Well, since we found out the president was coming last week, hasn't it, Katrina? That's right. This auditorium holds about 1,600 people, and it's jam-packed today. And students are really excited that they're getting a chance to show it off. You know, this is really exciting for them. It's a project that took a couple of years to complete. They just had one of their first shows in here last month, and now the president's here. So what an honor. But now, these are mostly invited guests here. What's the rest of the school doing while this is going on? Well, there are about 50 students that are in here that are going to get to hear the president firsthand. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is in their classrooms, and most of them will be watching this on closed circuit at television so they'll, they'll he'll be close by but uh, you know they'll still be watching him on TV how about teachers too this is a great uh, teaching opportunity um, what have they been telling you well there are some teachers who are in the audience today most of them will be discussing this with their classrooms afterwards and we're going to be going inside one of those later to hear exactly what they're teaching the students about this visit uh, one other interesting thing Athena claims it'll be business as usual today yeah. a normal school day <laughs> but nobody was allowed to park in the parking lot there was a great shuttle system set up from Wegmans just up Long Pond Road, uh, but it really isn't business as usual. I think everyone's going to have, have a hard time focusing on anything but this, don't you? That's right. I mean, it, they try to have business as usual, and I think they're doing a great job in doing so, but students could not be late for school today. They had to be here on time, and once you're in the building, you have to stay in there yeah, in sort of as, a lockdown. As we are locked into the auditorium <laughs> right, right now. That's right. Katrina, thank you very much. And now, let's go outside across the street from Greece Athena, where Steve Levine is with supporters and uh, protesters. Steve? That's right, Kevin. We've got a large crowd here. Let's just check out Long Pond Road. The crowd started about 5 o'clock this morning. It swelled to at least 1,500 folks right now. As you can see, the American flags, the signs welcoming the president, the signs from folks who have issues with the president, they are all here. As you said, the president is on his way. You can see the helicopter has started to arrive. The police entourage is all in front of the high school, ready and waiting waiting for President Bush and his motorcade to come through and begin this speech, which is scheduled in the next few minutes. The motorcade is on its way. Let's see if we can see it right now. It's expected to be turning down Long Pond Road in the next few minutes. Now, this motorcade arrived yesterday afternoon at the airport with another couple of 
vehicles as well as equipment and materials that the president uses. This motorcade travels with the president, always shows up the day before to get things in place. So the president is set and ready to go. As you saw, as soon as he walked off the plane, things were in place. He hopped in the limo and off he went. We should also point out that as he travels up 390, he's going to see a beautiful sight. Road crews have been busy working, cleaning, picking up garbage. They were patching the potholes. They were cutting the grass to make sure that Greece has a beautiful look when it arrives. They also painted the welcome sign too. Let's take a look and see if the motorcade is on its way. We see flashing lights and we can see it looks as if the motorcade is coming down. As you can see there are police waiting for them. We told you that folks started lining up about five o'clock this morning and here it comes. Here comes the motorcade yeah. of President Bush. This is the first car. It's a state police cruiser. And in the next few minutes, we should see the motorcade of the president. As you said, the scheduled event is Steve, supposed to begin in the next few minutes, Kevin. Hey, Steve, let's stay on this shot right here. But Dave McKinley is with me now. And, uh, well, it's a quick trip from the airport because he doesn't have to stop for any That's right. Lines, that's right. It? They close that's about right. 100 roads, they say, to get the president in and out and to Greece Athena High School within a matter of minutes. What's going to happen here is once he does arrive, uh, he will be whisked in a, a secured door, and then they're going to take one more security sweep here of Greece Athena. So while he... He is expected to arrive momentarily. Should be a moment or two more after yeah. that before the crowd here gets to uh, gets to see the president in person. And, and among the crowd here, yeah, let's talk about that, Dave. There's well, quite a few familiar faces. Uh, some familiar faces. Buffalo Bills fans would need no introduction of uh, Jim, Jim Kelly, Kelly, who uh, was the I only one. I noticed he got one, through security yeah. rather quickly. He's the only one I saw today that didn't have to stop and show ID or anything else. He, his wife, and his daughter Erin were just brought up to the front of the line. Oh well, rank has its privileges and they, there's a serious discussion about Jim Kelly running for some sort of political office uh -huh. on the Republican ticket. Well, he would certainly be nice to have the president S in your corner for that. Someone else, uh, speaking of sports and good sports, uh, who didn't need any introduction and got in without showing ID was young Katie Brownell. Yes. Uh, the 12-year-old uh, pitching <laughs> sensation. We did a story about her. Uh, she's seated right over to. Uh, yeah, I was just taking a peek to, to see. Our we, left she and wore her right. uniform today, yeah. so we could tell who Katie was. She'll, she'll be easy to tell, and, and we expect the president uh, to acknowledge her today for throwing that perfect game in the Oakfield Any big Little surprises? League. How about the gold ticket holders? What do you think? These are the people who got the, the handpicked, I'm sure, to yeah. sit behind the president. What do well, you think? Well, they're handpicked. They always are handpicked. One of George Bush's critics the other day told me that uh, he believes Stalin used to face more opposition uh, back in, in communist After all, Russia. This is, a, this is a, a planned event. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. And they're all like this. Uh, there was one in Buffalo last year. Uh, whatever the theme is, they try and get a representative population. And, of course, it is handpicked. They don't want opposition showing up in this building. As for who you're seeing there, well, uh, we see Maybe some firefighters. Okay. Well, here's they the were motorcade. told the yep. motorcade's arriving. And, Kurt Smith, why don't you come back in here, too? And let's just watch this. Uh, Kurt, Dave was mentioning that the president will be brought in. <clears throat> and there will be a final security sweep done, yes. correct? Yes, that's correct. I suspect he will probably will pass security, however. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Steve he, Levine, he's can been you hear the us drill. right now? Get him! Steve, can you hear us outside? president! Okay, as we can hear, uh, there are some demonstrators out there, which is uh, everybody's right to gather across the street and express their opinion, correct? Democracy ain't it grand, yes. This is something that presidents, trust me, are inured to and accustomed to uh, far more up close than the demonstrators are now. And so this, this entourage we're watch, watching, um, there's a lot of vehicles. <laughs> Who are right. in all these vehicles? Oh, any Republican that uh, is of a certain stripe, I suspect, of some state officials and a number of White House officials. I don't know if Andy Card, uh, my former boss in the Bush administration, now the chief of staff to uh, this president, uh, is there. I suspect he probably is. Uh, some speechwriters, a number of press people. And, of course, I don't know where the press itself is. There probably is a bus to bring uh, them from the airport as well. But it is a very long motorcade. Motorcades in any city, literally, totally, the county and the city revolve around them. Yeah, well, everything shuts down. I mean, that's the way yes. it is. Dave, what, what, what are your thoughts about just the efficiency and the organization of this whole event? 
I think uh, as far it's gone off without a hitch so far. There was a little bit of a snag with security. Uh, they really only had two magnetometers yeah. to get 1,600 people in here. So there were some kind of grumpy faces outside. It was Obviously, faster at the, at the airport. Actually. Everyone was yeah. Everyone was excited to see the president, no doubt. But it, it was a kind of a steady cold rain here when most of the guests arrived. But they did it all by shuttle bus. They yeah. came down, yes. and I thought that was very well organized. It was just that last yeah. 20 minutes of standing in the rain, but waiting they... to get through the two magnetometers. But as far as the police yeah. and everyone else, uh, you know, they only they didn't have that much time. Uh, this this was just they just found out about this Wednesday. We knew it just about as soon as they did. It's astonishing when yeah. you get the White House and the state and the local and the county GOP I'm, involved or any political party. Uh, obstacles are thrown aside and things get done. I'm going to ask our photographer to pan over to the left here because we've just seen a side door open. And a oh, number that's, of people uh, the coming national in. media coming in. Kevin. Oh, it is sure. This yeah, is the, the White House press uh, corps that travels yes. with the president everywhere, right, Kurt? Yeah. Everywhere. And they even when in, they don't want to, they travel. They come in last minute. Uh, they're right there with the head of the motorcade. They're brought in. You're going to see them come up here and maybe crowd us a little bit. Uh, they're they're in and out of here real quick, and and that's who you're seeing. So uh, that would mean that the the president is not far behind. And Kurt, really, if we're to get any public comment about what the president thinks about Rochester, other than what he says from the stage, it would be from the White House press corps, probably in a briefing before or after this. I right? think On so. Air Force One. I I think that's correct. Uh, the uh, the White House pool of reporters uh, restricted to maybe five or six, which goes on Air Force One, and uh, that would certainly be, I think, the access. We, but he'll. We are looking live outside uh, a protester uh, being, well, escorted off the premises by police. We're really not sure uh, what happened there. Our Steve Levine is outside, and Steve, if once your mic gets hot, if you can comment on that and tell us what happened there. Uh, it is getting rather loud outside. And uh, Kevin, I, can't, I, believe I can hear you. Go. It's rather loud where we are. Uh, you see a professor from Nazareth College who showed up here about 8 o'clock. He had a problem with the uh, authorities around 8. He tried to stand at that corner. They told him to come across the street. He did that. We spoke for him to him for a few minutes. Uh, he was here until just a short while ago, and then he and Sister Grace, who many folks are familiar with, uh, were arrested and are apparently being taken away by authorities. Well, it looks looks like uh, that gentleman. I don't think it's been handcuffed, but hands tied, definitely waiting for uh, uh, obviously to secure everything. Well, before. Steve said that that was a professor, correct? I, I think so. I guess he will not be teaching class this yeah. afternoon. You can't see them, folks, but uh, as this was going on immediately, uh, many people left their seats, and, and they're down here checking out a monitor we have of this live picture of these protesters being arrested. Uh, Steve Levine mentioned uh, Sister Grace Miller, no stranger to yeah. civil disobedience. Yes. She. Yes. And well, Kevin and Dave, they were I, with us just a few minutes ago. Steve, did they... Steve, did you see any any reason why they would have been arrested or what they would have said or they done? They just quietly walked over and began demonstrating and began uh, sending a message out about the uh, feelings they have about President Bush, and there was a swarm of authorities and police around them with a matter of seconds. Like I said, uh, this gentleman who told us he is a professor uh, was there about uh, 8, 9 o'clock this morning who wanted to stand at that corner at the entrance of the high school. He had a conversation with police for a few minutes. He walked Walked across the street. He was standing with us for about until up until a few minutes ago, and then they both walked over there and began their demonstrations and their feelings against the uh, the war. Well, I guess this is a part of every presidential yeah, visit, isn't and, it? And you know, uh, everyone has a difficult job today, but I think the police probably uh, the most of all because they have to walk that fine line between protecting someone's constitutional right to free speech. On the other hand, no one can be uh, uh, permitted to uh, preclude or, or impinge upon an event itself. And so there are cases like this where the police make a decision. And as we found out, even coming in here today, I mean, there are rules, and you must follow them, or yeah. the Secret Service makes no bones about removing you. Well, I'll tell you what, we had mentioned that there were several people who had gathered around a monitor that's just below us, 
from their seats to huddle around and take a look at the yeah. live pictures we had. And uh, I thought we were going to have an incident in here for a minute because <laughs> security started coming you know, down and telling those Henry, people to get back to Henry, their seats. Henry Kissinger said that power is the great aphrodisiac. I think television is the great aphrodisiac. Well, people tend to commute. Kevin and Dave, Kevin and Dave, yeah. this is Steve yeah, outside. Steve, uh, you. As you can see, there have been a lot of folks here who are uh, protesting and demonstrating their feelings on a number of things, uh, specifically the war, uh, taxes, and as well as there's some folks here from Niagara Falls regarding the military bases, but up until now it's been very peaceful, very quiet. In fact, they showed up here about an hour ago, standing along the corner alongside with us, uh, letting their message be known, and then once the president arrived in the building, that's when uh, several of these folks walked across the street and tried their own demonstrating where they were told a few hours ago they were not allowed to be. But up until now, it's been quiet and it's been peaceful. A little loud, but it's been quiet and peaceful. Okay, Steve, we're going to take uh, a quick break by tossing it back to Maureen McGuire in our studio, and we'll, we'll be back with more from uh, Athena High School. Maureen? All right, quite a momentous day, and we will be right back. To Greece, Athena, the new performing arts center here. Uh, the White House entourage uh, has arrived or is in the process of ar arriving. People who were in the uh, reception line at the Rochester Airport have now arrived. That is Monroe County Executive Maggie Brooks. Uh, I also see uh, Monroe County Sheriff uh, Patrick O'Flynn. Uh, reserved seating uh, for everybody here. There's Steve Menarek, the uh, state Republican chair and also the Monroe County chair, John Auberger, uh, Grease Town Supervisor. So this is a good indication, guys, that uh, the president can't be far away. And maybe the most important member of that crew, we can't see him, but he's just in the last in line. There he is coming into view right now, David Flaum, a developer who's also the member of something called the $100,000 Club. As far as fundraising goes for yes. this particular president, he raised $100,000 or contributed Man. as much. Uh, one of the largest Bush That's right. campaign contributors in this area, if not the entire state. I right? would agree. In fact, his uh, largesse to this president goes back to before he became president in the 2000 campaign and uh, has been an extraordinary and exorbitant giver to the president since, uh, as you suggest, not simply one of the largest developers in this area, but I would doubtless say uh, arguably in all of upstate New York. In fact, he has a private plane, and uh, George W. Bush has flown on that plane before. So uh, their ties uh, run long and deep. Well, and uh, those kind of donations get you a pretty good seat, as far as I can tell. It's up in the Jim <laughs> Kelly section. It's amazing. Guys. It's yes. amazing the cause and effect. He's right over near <laughs> Katie Brown Alley. You can't get much better than that. <laughs> So, uh, we've got a couple of minutes. We're waiting for the president to arrive here at the Performing Arts Center at Athena. Uh, quickly, uh, Dave, let's start with you. What do you expect this morning? Well, I would expect the president to uh, talk about Social Security. I would expect him to use terms like crisis and bankruptcy. And I would expect people, particularly those outside, uh, to respond that he might have used those terms to describe his own fiscal policies. Uh, they will no doubt bring up outside that uh, he inherited a surplus. It's gone. That we have unprecedented debt, and uh, including $300 billion for a war in Iraq. That's what they're going to say outside. Inside, we're going to have him here saying that it is, it is something that must be done that uh, money should not stay in Washington. It should go back to the American people to invest as they choose. But Kurt, and you know this, there's a lot of people who saw the stock market as its cyclical nature as it is, and they're a little bit unsure Look, about that. There this. were a lot of Republicans who, who questioned very grievously the president's decision to begin his second term, to bank his resources and his agenda almost solely on his ability to convince Congress to reform Social Security. This is the cornerstone of the New Deal. This is the most sacrosanct program of the Democratic Party. He has garnered virtually no Democratic support thus far. What is more alarming, if I were in the White House today, it has gained very little visible support from the Republican Party as well. That's the conundrum, and today that's but his challenge but as well. the campaign continues it does. Uh, to push his plan. Again, I believe this is the 27th that's right. town hall meeting the president's had on and, Social Security. And there will Security. be many, many more. We're early on the list this time. Uh, but because it is such a staunchly Republican burg in Greece, that above all, as well as his friendship with Tom Reynolds, I believe is why the president is here today. What will be very interesting as well, stylistically, I don't see uh, teleprompter panes up there. I doubt, therefore, there's going to be a formal text. I think the president will be today in his Monty Hall, Oprah Winfrey, lavalier mic, and he'll be talking to the audience. It will be very informal, and he performs probably yeah. at his best in this kind of format. Will he know what the questions are ahead of time? <laughs> uh, if he takes any. If. Well, and I, I think there are some students, actually, who've been given permission to ask questions, one yes. or two, and some designated people, but 
but you, you think know, he's going to know what they're going to ask. I, I would bet he would. I would be shocked if he were asked a question today that he has not yet been asked. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, again, we are waiting for the arrival of uh, President George Bush here at the beautiful new Performing Arts Center here at Greece Athena High School. Outside, uh, protesters and supporters, but it appears from the looks of our cameras, as you can see right there, that there are more protesters than supporters. Steve Levine, uh, if your mic is on, I'd like just to have you give us an update. What's the latest from, from out there on the corner? Well, Kevin, there are protesters here, but what you can see are the thousands of folks who are lining up along Long Pond Road who are here to support the president with red, white, and blue flags. They're here waving them. There's kids of all ages. We talked with a seven-year-old who was here to see her president, as well as you see the folks here who have come to let their uh, feelings be known about the war, about how they want the war to be stopped. We also have people who have traveled all the way from Niagara Falls to let the president know they're not happy about the potential military be base being closed there, as well as er several other issues. Uh, I spoke with one woman who is uh, not very happy happy with the president's uh, stance on uh, gay marriage. She came to let her feelings be known. And uh, we should also tell you there's also some capitalism going on here. Several neighbors who have decided to charge to have people park on their lawns for five bucks. Uh, the neighbor I talked to who says he hopes to make enough money to buy a pizza for his family uh, says it's the American way, Kevin. So lots of folks, <laughs> even though the is. president is inside, are sticking around waiting for him to come out to uh, say goodbye as he heads back home. Steve, I just want to make it clear, have you seen the president's limousine pass by you yet? Yes, we understand that the motorcade is, uh, is inside and that uh, they are getting ready to go. Well, Steve, let's come back here inside. And Congressman Tom Reynolds has just been introduced and President George W. Bush. Thank you. Be seated. Please be seated. We're going to start. Thank you. Welcome to the Athena Performing Arts Center. Today we have come to talk about the future. In Greece, a town I'm proud to represent in Congress, we are working together to make our future more secure. In this post 9-11 world, when we talk about a secure future, we're not only talking about keeping our nation and our homeland safe, but it is also about economic security, retirement security. America is fortunate to have a leader who has the strength and resolve to fight to keep our families and communities safe and who has shown the compassion and determination needed to ensure a secure economic future for all generations. Ladies, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce and welcome to Greece, New York, the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush. Thank you all. Go ahead and be seated. Stay seated. You're doing it. Be seated. Thank you. We got to get to work. Thank you all for coming. Please be seated. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the warm welcome. And thanks for caring about the future of our country because that's what we're here to discuss. Before I get to the social security issue, I do want to thank some people. First, I want to thank um, the Greece Athena Middle and High Schools for letting us use this fantastic facility. It really is beautiful. Yeah. It's a fantastic place, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. I want to thank Helen Wall and Dick Snyder. 
Helen is the principal of the high school. Dick Snyder is the principal of the middle school. I want to thank all the teachers. I want to thank the superintendent. I want to thank all the folks who care a lot about making sure the kids get educated here in this part of the world. I'm sorry Laura's not here. Yeah, I'm, yeah you, you probably would rather have her here than me, wouldn't you? Anyway. <laughs> Well, I know, but you thought it. You didn't say it, but I could tell you thought it. You're not the only person here who feels that way, I want you to know. She's doing great. She's uh, on a trip uh, promoting the freedom agenda. She's made it very clear to uh, people in the Middle East, you can't have a complete society unless women participate fully in the society in the Middle East. I, I'm really proud of her. And I'm a fortunate man that she, uh, she said yes when I asked her to marry me back in Midland, Texas. She's a great first lady. Uh, I'm looking forward to having her come home tonight back to the White House. I thank, uh, I thank Congressman Tom Reynolds. He's a, an effective United States Congressman who cares a lot about this district. I'm proud to call him friend. I'm proud to call Congressman Shirley Bullard friend as well. Sherry is from the district next door. I've known him for a long time. He's a good, thoughtful man who's a fine United States Congressman. <laughs> Congressman Jim Walsh is with us today. He too is a fine United States Congressman. And I was proud to be traveling with Congressman Randy Cool. He's a freshman member of the House of Representatives, doing a great job. Thank you all for coming. They, they wanted to ride on Air Force One. It's proud to make room for them. They want to ride back on Air Force One. And they probably want a meal on Air Force One. So save up your appetite, fellas. You got a good meal coming. I want to thank all the state and local officials who've joined us today. I'm proud you're here. Uh, there's two athletes in the audience I want to pay um, recognition to. First of all, a, a person you all know well, really a fine member of the community, member of the NFL Hall of Fame, Jim Kelly. Thank you for coming. Good to see you again, Jim. And at the other age of the, uh, at the other end of the age spectrum, is a fine athlete from this part of the world. I just met her. As you know, I'm a baseball person. I love baseball. Uh, the fact that somebody uh, would pitch a perfect game at any uh, level of baseball is uh, is amazing. The fact that a person would pitch a, a perfect game and strike out every batter is even more amazing. So welcome a fantastic pitcher in the uh, representing the Dodgers baseball team from Little League Baseball Katie Brannell thanks for coming and finally one other person before I get to the topic at hand that I'd like to introduce is a woman named George Ann Schauffel George Ann is a volunteer and the reason I bring up people who volunteer is I want to remind you that the true strength of this country lies in the hearts and souls of our citizens. That if you want to be a participant in America and in the future of America, volunteer to make somebody's life better. Feed the hungry, help find shelter for the homeless. George Ann is involved with the literacy volunteers of Rochester program, helping somebody learn to read. I can't think of a better way to pass on a gift from one generation to the next than to mentor somebody, particularly somebody who needs to learn to read. My point is this, serve your community and serve your country by taking time out of your busy lives to volunteer to make somebody's life better, to answer that universal call to love a neighbor just like you'd like to be loved yourself. I don't know where George Ann is. Where are you, George Ann? Thanks for coming. Thanks for being a great role model. We got a lot to do in Washington, D.C. 
One of the big issues, of course, is Social Security, although yesterday there was some progress made. I'm pleased that the Senate is moving forward on my judicial nominees who were previously being blocked. These nominees have been waiting years for an up or down vote on the Senate floor, and now they'll get one. It's about time we're making some progress. It's, uh, it's important for this nation to address issues. I believe the job of the president is to confront problems, not to pass them on to future presidents or future generations. I believe my job in representing everyone who lives in this country is if I see a problem is to say to the United States Congress, let's work together to solve the problem. And folks, we got a problem when it comes to Social Security. First, let me start by saying that Franklin Roosevelt did a good thing when he created the Social Security system. Social Security has been an important part of a lot of people's lives in America. It's, the Social Security system created by Franklin Roosevelt provided a safety net for people in their retirement. And it worked. There are a lot of people still in this country counting on their Social Security check. And therefore, I want to start by saying to people who are getting their check, people who were born prior to 1950, the system will not change when it comes to you. The system has got plenty of money in it to make sure you get your check. And the reason I have to say that is because I understand how the Social Security issue has worked in the past. Somebody like me talks about it, and then somebody comes in behind by telling seniors really what he's saying, he's going to take away your check. That's old-style scare politics, but it is a part of the American system. And so people ought to got to understand when we start talking about Social Security to strengthen the Social Security system for generations to come, to deal with the problem I'm about to describe to you, that if you're a senior in Greece, New York, you're going to get your check. It's the folks coming up that you need to worry about. See, if you're a grandmother, you're going to get your check. You need to be worried about your grandson. And we're about to talk to a generation of, uh, of folks from this part of the world about Social Security. Now, here's the reason I'm being able to bring it up, that, that the pay-as-you-go system in Social Security is confronting some serious demographic difficulties. Now, the system is pay-as-you-go. That means when you pay in, uh, we go ahead and pay out. Like your payroll tax goes into a, not into a trust that we hold for your account, your payroll tax goes into account, and we pay out the money for the retirees, and with any money left over, we spend it on general government. It's important for people to understand that aspect of Social Security. In other words, it's not a trust. In other words, we're not taking your money and holding it for you and then giving it back to you when you retire. We're taking your money, we're spending it on current retirees, and in that, more money is coming in that needs to go out for the retirees, we're spending on other programs. And all that's left behind in Social Security uh, is a, a group of file cabinets with IOUs in it. That's the way the system works. It's called pay-as-you-go. Now, what's going to change from today uh, in terms of the pay-as-you-go system is that there's a lot of people getting ready to retire. I happen to be one of them. <laughs> At least I reach retirement age. In 2008, as I like to remind people, that's a convenient date for me. To <laughs> <laughs> Particularly the end of 2008. <laughs> and there are a lot of people like me. We're called the baby boomers. I'm looking at some baby boomers out there. As a matter of fact, by the time the baby boomers fully retire, there's going to be over 70 million of us getting paid uh, by younger workers who are paying, through payroll, paying the, our retirement through payroll taxes. Today, there's about 40 million retirees. So you see, a lot more people are going to be having to take, be taken care of in the retirement system through the pay-as-you-go system. And not only that, we're going to live longer than the previous generation. And not only that, our benefits are going to rise faster at least the promised benefits will rise faster than a previous generation. So you've got a lot of people who will be living longer, getting paid greater benefits, with fewer people paying into the system. In 1950, there were some 16 to 1 workers 
paying into the system for each beneficiary. Today, there's 3.3 workers per every beneficiary. Soon, there's going to be two workers for every beneficiary. So I think you're beginning to get a sense of the math. A lot of us are going to get greater benefits. We're going to live longer with fewer of the young people paying in the system to take care of us. Now, what ends up happening under that type of system is that in 2017, the system starts to go into the red. More money going out than coming in on Social Security benefits for Social Security benefits related to payroll taxes. And it gets worse every year. 2027, uh, it's projected there be, will be $200 billion in the hole, $200 billion of more benefits going out than payroll taxes coming in. Every year worse after that until 2041. All those uh, paper in those file cabinets in West Virginia are just eaten up, bankrupt. The system's bust. What we're asking youngsters to do is to contribute money through payroll taxes into a system that'll be broke in 2041 unless we do something about it. And so that's the problem, and it's a real problem. My friend Tim Penny, former congressman from Minnesota, is going to describe the problem to you in further detail. Now, I have a duty not only to describe the problem, I believe I have a duty to come forth and say, let's do something about it, and here's some ideas uh, to the United States Congress. I did it. I stood up in front of the... Uh, Congress at my State of the Union. I said, here's a problem, by the way, here's some ideas. All ideas are on the table, except running up the payroll tax rate, which I think would hurt the economy. All ideas are on the table. Bring them forward. And then I further refine that by talking about some of these ideas. And the reason I'm doing this is because I understand if we wait, it costs $600 billion a year more every year we wait. See, if we don't do anything, if we don't come up with a solution to permanently solve this problem, it is conceivable a younger generation of Americans will have to pay an 18% payroll tax. Or benefits will have to be cut by 30%. Or the rest of government will have to be cut substantially in order to make sure that the promises that have been made or promises that will be kept. And so here's some ideas Congress needs to consider. Uh, first of all, that a future generation should receive benefits equal to or greater than the benefits enjoyed by today's seniors. That seems like a reasonable principle as we go forward. Secondly, that the Social Security system should be designed such, the future Social Security. By the way, if you're born prior to 1950, nothing changes. What I'm talking about here doesn't pertain to you. You're going to get your check. The system's going to be exactly the way it is. There's plenty of money in it to take care of you. It's the younger folks that need to be paying attention to what I'm talking about. And so I think a second principle ought to be this. If you've worked all your life, that you should not retire in poverty. That's a principle that makes sense. We can design a system that supports that concept. And here's the way you do it. It's called progressive indexing. That's a Washington kind of thing, you know. <laughs> it says that if you're in the... Uh, for example, a guy named Posen, who Tim knows well, uh, came up with this concept. It said that if you're uh, a poorest 30 percent of the workers, nothing will change uh, in terms of how your benefits increase. Right now, the benefits, by the way, are increases are tied to wages. If you're the top 1 percent of workers in terms of income, your benefits would increase by the rate of inflation, not by the r rate of wage. Your benefits increase, but not as fast as the folks at the bottom end of the spectrum. And if you're in between, depending upon your income, your benefits will increase somewhere between the rate of wage and the rate of price. Now, incredibly enough, structuring the system this way when it comes to benefit increases will get about a significant portion of the problem permanently solved. I think it makes sense for Congress to consider this idea. It says you'll get a benefit equal to or greater than the previous generation that at the very minimum your benefit will grow at the rate of inflation. If you're poor, your benefit will grow at the rate of wage increases and that you won't retire into poverty. And there are other things we can do to permanently solve the problem completely. I say permanently solve it because you might remember 1983. Were you in the Congress then, Tim? Yeah, first term in the Congress. Tim came together with others. Ronald Reagan was the president. Tip O'Neill was the speaker. We had a problem in Social Security. They came together and put together what they called a 75-year fix. Here we are 22 years later. <laughs> the 75-year fix didn't stick for 75 years. It's time to fix this deal once and for all. 
And there are some good ideas I put on the table. Let me tell you one other good idea that I want people to think about uh, before we get to um, our panelists here, our, dis our folks we're going to be discussing this issue with. And that is that I think that as we permanently solve the system, that we ought to make it a better deal for younger workers by allowing younger workers to take some of their own payroll taxes and set it aside in what is called a voluntary personal savings account. First, <laughs> notice I said voluntary. In other words, the government should say to a younger worker, if you want to, you can put some of your own money aside. You don't have to. If, if, if you're uncomfortable with uh, watching your money grow through a conservative mix of bonds and stocks, you don't have to do that. You can keep it the way, you know, the, into the system. And you'll get your check. If you're in the bottom 30%, your check, your benefits over time will grow with wages. If you're in the top 1%, it will grow with inflation. And if you're somewhere in between, they'll grow depending upon your income, but greater than the rate of inflation. Secondly, it's called a personal account. That means you own it. It's an account the government cannot take away. So, so why, would you, why, would, why would we do this? Why would we think of this idea? Well, first of all, with your money and you know, your payroll taxes, after all, it's your money, is earning about a 1.8% rate of return over time in the Social Security system. You can do better than that. You can do better than that with T-bills, which have very little risk to them, if, if any at all. You can do a lot better than that in a conservative mix of, of uh, bonds and stocks. I mean, they say that over time, you should be able to average at least 4.6%. Now, over a lifetime, that is a significant amount of money relative to the 1.8%, because money compounds, money grows. For example, if you're making $8 an hour, and you put your money in, and you're allowed to set aside a third of your payroll taxes, $8 an hour over your life, and you're allowed to set a third of your payroll taxes aside in a personal savings account, and you earn the 4.5% uh, rate of return, which is definitely achievable, particularly when you look at the history of conservative mix of investments. Uh, uh, by the time it comes you re reach retirement age, you'll have earned $100,000 in your nest egg that will be a part of your Social Security retirement system. See, you'll get benefits out of the current system, out of the system that's reformed. Plus, you got $100,000 that you call your own. If you're, say you're a, a, a police officer and a nurse and they enter the workforce in 2011 and you set aside money and you make, you know, the average salary those folks make over time and you set aside a third of your payroll taxes, both of you do, by the time both retire, they have about $669,000 in a personal savings account. Money grows over time. The higher the rate of return, the more your faster your money grows and the more you end up with. A lot of people are able to understand that. You know why? Because we're into a 401k culture. When Penny and I were growing up, we didn't have 401ks. The other day I was in an automobile manufacturing plant in Mississippi. I'm sitting with a lot of line workers. I said, how many of you got 401ks? A lot of hands went up. A lot of people from different walks of life, different backgrounds, now understand what it means to watch your money grow. This isn't a new concept that's uh, in American society. This is something that's taken place throughout all, all, all of society. And I think it makes sense to understand the investor class doesn't belong to a privileged few, but the investor class ought to be extended to everybody who lives in America if that's what you want, if that's what you choose. I like the idea of somebody saying, here's your asset, and you can leave it to whomever you want. And the more people who are able to do that in our society, the better off society is. See, I think government ought to promote an ownership society. We ought to encourage more people to own their own home. Encourage entrepreneurs to be able to take risk and own their own business. And in this case, encourage Americans from all walks of life, if they so choose, to manage their own retirement account. And I say manage it. You know, it's your money. You're going to have some choices to make when it comes to a personal savings account. 
You can't take it to the lottery, by the way. You know, notice I've been stressing conservative mix of bonds and stocks because we want this account to grow and be a part of a modern safety net for you and your retirement. And so there'll be some guidelines. And uh, I can predict to you that it works because a lot of other people have watched their money grow in the same kind of accounts, including people who work for the federal government. See, we have got what in Washington what's called a thrift savings plan. And uh, members of the United States Senate, for example, can choose if they so desire to set aside some of their own money in a personal savings account, a voluntary personal savings account. And a lot of people like it. I think uh, it was, I was doing one of these events with uh, Senator McCain, who told me that his, his rate of return on his money was like 7% over the last 20 years. That's a lot better than the 1.8% we now get for you in the Social Security system. And so my attitude about this issue uh, on, on uh, thrift savings of plans when I speak to members of the Congress is pretty simple. If the idea of taking some of your own money and setting it aside in a conservative mix of bonds and stocks is good enough for you, Mr. Senator, it is good enough for workers all across the United States of America. You'd be happy to hear Senator McCain agrees with me because he's seen his money grow. Now, a personal savings account would be a part of a Social Security retirement system. It'd be a part of what you would have to retire when you reach retirement age. As, you, as I mentioned to you earlier, we're going to redesign the current system. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you've got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. But if you choose to have one of these accounts, notice I keep saying, if you choose, the government's not going to tell you you have to do this. I think the government ought to give you the opportunity to set up one of these accounts, and the account becomes a part of your retirement plan. It's your own asset. It's something you leave to somebody, whomever you choose. And it makes the system eminently more fair. Now, with those thoughts in mind, we got a problem, and here's some ideas on how to solve it. I've asked uh, Congressman Tim Penny, right out of the state of Minnesota, a person who's followed this issue a lot. He happens to be of a different political party than I am, but nevertheless, we both share the common goal of doing our duty as involved citizens to permanently solve the problem of Social Security today. Welcome, Congressman. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I thank you, Mr. President. You mentioned earlier that uh, you were bringing me along to sort of add some additional perspective to this issue, uh, but th there's, there's little more that needs to be said given the uh, uh, description that you've just provided because you've laid out very effectively and uh, where we're at and why change is needed. Uh, I would simply reinforce uh, some of what you've said. Uh, doing nothing is not an option, and unfortunately, um, on this issue, there seems to be a loud chorus of folks that are just saying no to virtually uh, everything that you've put forward, and that's unfortunate because we needed a dialogue on this issue, and the sooner the better. You know, this, this program is 70 years old this summer on August 14th. Social Security will celebrate its 70th birthday, uh, and we really need to talk about where we want this program to be 70 years from now. And I don't think we want to be right back at the same place 70 years from now talking about more cuts and splices and patches to kind of keep the program uh, afloat because we've done a lot of that over the last uh, 70 years and what it's meant is that for each succeeding generation of workers we pay more and more payroll taxes into this system and then none of it gets saved in our own name to help provide for our own retirement which then means we rely on the next generation of workers to put even more money in uh, to take care of our needs and at some point I think we've got to get ahead of that curve uh, and that's what this debate is all about. 
Uh, a lot has changed since 1935 when this program was created. Uh, it was created at a time when we needed a safety net for senior citizens. It was created as an insurance program to protect seniors from impoverishment in old age. And the reason it was an insurance program is because back in 1935, most Americans did not expect to live to age 65 or to draw any benefits under this program. But if they got to that age, uh, they wanted to make sure that uh, they had some kind of a safety net they could, they could fall back on. Uh, average life expectancy then was 60. Today, about 80. Uh, and so we know that we're going to uh, live uh, well into retirement, and we're counting on Social Security to be a piece of our retirement income. Um, and so the program has had that change over time. You talked about the demographic shifts that have occurred. Uh, when we were born, uh, there were about 15 workers for every retiree in American society. And so the old system, with a relatively small payroll tax rate, could support those retirees uh, at, a, at a decent level. Uh, by the time Medicare was created in 1965, uh, there were only six workers for every retiree. And su not surprisingly, the payroll tax was quite a bit higher by then in order to keep the program in the black. Today there are three and a half workers for every retiree and the payroll taxes are even higher, uh, 12 and a half percent on the first $90,000 of income. Uh, and as you said, by the time the baby boom generation, our generation is fully retired uh, in the year 2030, there will be about two workers for every retiree. And if we keep fixing this the way we've always fixed it, it'll mean simply higher payroll taxes on the next generation of workers to keep enough money flowing. Uh, you also referenced 1983, uh, and that leads to my second point. Um, first point is doing nothing is not an option. Uh, and the second point is that doing something sooner is better than later. And that's why I applaud the fact that you've put this on the front burner, uh, because it's better to deal with this now, uh, several years ahead of the financial crunch uh, in this program than to wait until the last minute. Because the last time we fixed this was 1983, my very first year in Congress. Um, and uh, we had no good options at that point. Uh, we basically had to cut benefits. We delayed cost of living increases. Um, and then we raised payroll taxes because we needed to get some money in the door and get it in the door fast. So if you wait until the last minute, those are really the only two options available to you. Uh, and part of the mistake we made in 1983 is that we did by raising payroll taxes, uh, draw in more revenue than we were going to need for the next few decades to, to pay benefits. Uh, but we didn't save them uh, in an honest way. Uh, we, we put them in a trust fund that was essentially spent to cover overspending in the rest of the budget, as you said, spent on other general fund items, didn't save them for this uh, program. So it means that when the trust fund comes due beginning in the year 2017, we've got to cut other government programs or raise other government taxes or borrow to put the money back into the trust fund. Uh, if we then had set up individual accounts for young workers, uh, we'd be well on our way to a solution to this problem uh, today because on top of a safety net, you would then have uh, that extra money uh, set aside in your own name, invested in a fund that you control the way, as you said, federal workers now have a fund they can invest in. And it would be a pre-funded retirement system on top of a safety net that could work very well. And that's my last point. This is not about current retirees. Uh, they have a lot to offer in terms of uh, uh, their experience with the program. Um, they have an awful lot to offer in terms of uh, um, how to build the safety net. Um, but it's their grandchildren and their children that have the most at stake here because uh, there's no dispute on Capitol Hill that we're going to take care of anyone that's at or near retirement under the old system because those are the rules they worked under. Uh, but we need a new system with new rules. Uh, and I'm convinced that, that if we didn't have Social Security today and we were to sit down to craft a new program, uh, we would craft one along the lines that you've described with a safety net that no one can fall below, a safety net that's big enough to keep everyone uh, above the poverty line once they've retired, but this voluntary personal account on top of it where some of our payroll taxes can go to invest for ourselves for our own retirement in, in the future. Uh, and that's the only way to give younger workers a better deal. Uh, I've got four kids, um, uh, all of whom are at that age now where they're beginning to work outside the home. Uh, a couple of them are still in school, a couple are out of school. Um, and I want for them over their 30, 40 uh, working uh, career uh, to have the opportunity to invest from the very first job they get. Uh, and if we don't do that during, with the Social Security system, people are going to wait too long. And that's the final point I'll make. Uh, right now, we have too many people uh, approaching 50 years old who aren't setting aside 
uh, appropriately to provide for their own retirement. And so they're counting on Social Security to do more than it's able to do for them. Um, I saw a statistic recently that said that of people 45 to 54, only 25% had set aside money in an individual retirement account, an IRA. Only 25%. And yet, we've got very generous tax incentives to do this, and many, many people aren't doing it. Some of them because they're procrastinating. Um, others uh, because they just don't have the extra money to do it. Um, but if only 25% are investing, how much are those 25% setting aside? On average, $13,000. That's not nearly enough. But if you start setting aside from the very first job you get, and we can do that within the Social Security system if, if we reform it along uh, the lines you've proposed, uh, by the time you get to be 45 or 50, those early investments will have compounded again and again and again, and you'll be well on your way to a comfortable retirement nest egg. Uh, and so if, if we're going to do reform, uh, we shouldn't just tinker around the edges the way we have in the past with some benefit cuts and some payroll tax increases. There's going to have to be, you know, some adjustments in those areas, and you've described a couple, the progressive index and other approaches, uh, to keep that underlying system in the black and to keep it solvent. But on top of that, we've got to do better. Otherwise, for each succeeding generation of Americans, it's, it becomes a worse and worse deal where they pay more, but they get less. Uh, the only way we can give them the opportunity to do better, to create a nest egg for themselves, uh, is with the kind of reform that includes personal accounts. It's personal accounts. So that's, uh, that's the drill, and uh, that's what this debate is all about. Um, and um, I think you've won the debate on these two key points. Um, whatever the opinion polls might say about specifics, because the specifics are always difficult. Uh, the vast majority of Americans, by two and three to one margins, agree that uh, we do have a pending problem, and they agree that we ought to deal with it sooner than later. Uh, and the other thing that's most important is when you talk to the younger Americans, the ones who have the most at stake in this reform, uh, they, they get the message about personal accounts being the best way to save for their future. And um, so I think, you know, just stay, stay at this uh, effort, and uh, let's see if we can't get some bipartisan support and get this done. Well, thank you, Tim. Good job. Real good job. Articulate guy, isn't he? Yeah. One thing you don't have to worry about is me staying with this effort. This is a vital issue. The American people expect those of us who are fortunate enough to serve in Washington to solve problems. And I've just begun. I like getting out of Washington to begin with. I like explaining the situation. But we're just beginning. If this were easy, it would have been done a while ago. And I fully recognize some in Washington, you know, don't particularly want, want to address this issue. It may be too difficult. And I recognize some of them say, well, this is, this is a partisan thing. You know, we don't want to make one party look good as opposed uh, at the expense of another. But let me tell you what I think is going to happen. I think, and Tim is right, I think more and more people recognize there's a problem. And people begin to say, go do something about it. And those who obstruct reform, no matter what party they're in, will pay a political price. In my judgment, people expect us to go to Washington, D.C. to work together. That's what they want to see, particularly when it comes to an issue like Social Security. We've got three members of a fine family here. we got grandmother, mom, and down there anchoring at the end is grandson or son. Isn't that right? That's right. Yeah. You are Audrey Saglinski. That's right. And I'm a 70-year-old widow. Don't ever say your age. And then we got... Oh, that, I have no problem. Don't ask me my weight, though. Okay. <laughs> Reminds me of my mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I was a teacher aide for Williamsville South High School for 25 years, and I retired from there. A very enjoyable job. I also wanted to mention I'm a volunteer for Meals on Wheels. Oh, fantastic. Which I'm missing today. <laughs> I hope somebody filled in. Oh behind. yes, we've got some great people there. It's a good, good group. Thanks for doing that. I like it a lot. 
Um, my husband and I retired eight years ago. Unfortunately, he passed on after only two years. So the money he had invested in Social Security, in a sense, was gone. Had we had a personal account, I would have had some money for Deb, Jeremy, his brothers, to pass on. Yeah, let me, let me stop you there if you don't mind. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> You have my permission. <laughs> yeah. Here's the way the system works. Two folks work. They both contribute to the Social Security system. If one dies early, the, the, the spouse, the re remaining spouse, gets to choose her benefits or his benefits, which are ever greater, but not both. Now think about that system. Dad went and contributed a lot into the system. He passed away. But the money he put in, most of the money he put in is gone. That's not fair. What kind of system is that? It's not a fair system. It's not fair to the family. It's not fair to the person who's worked all his life in this case. Had he been able to put a money aside in a personal account, that account would have gone to Audrey. That's right. Isn't that right? Keep going. Okay. You're on a roll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have five children, seven grandchildren and that's my concern. I think you making the young people aware that there's a problem is going to make them aware and encourage them to save. And yeah. I think that's what we need well, to Well, I see. appreciate that. Younger people need to pay attention to this issue. See, if, if, if nothing gets done in Congress, as Congressman Penny pointed out, you're gonna get to pay higher payroll taxes and higher and higher and higher payroll taxes. And so you need to pay attention. Actually, I believe younger people are beginning to pay closer attention to this issue. We're beginning to get their attention. First thing is, is there any doubt in your mind that you're going to get your check? I'm getting my check, and it's wonderful. So you're still coming? It's still coming. Yeah. And I'm planning on it for a while yet. Well, you need to, yeah. <laughs> Heading toward 80. That's right. Right around the corner. You look great. <laughs> Thank you very much. You look like 100 to me. That's where you're going to be. Okay. 30 more years? I'll remind you of that. All right, good. <laughs> and she wouldn't want her check. On her 99th birthday, she's going to want her check. That's right. And you're going to get your check. That's right. Okay. And so who'd you bring with you? I brought my daughter, Deborah, the oldest Deborah? of my five. Debbie or Deborah? Debbie. We yeah, like Deborah. to call her You Debbie. called her Deborah? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> only when she's in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> And Jeremy, uh, her youngest son. Fantastic. Uh, Debbie, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Mom did a good job, didn't she? Yes, she did. Yeah. Uh, so what was it like growing up? Was Mom pretty tough, a disciplinarian? Yes, she was. Well, uh, you and I <laughs> shared the same thing. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, tell me what's on your mind. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I was an at-home mom. I was privileged that my husband, who's here today, um, was willing to let me stay home and, you know, raise the kids, work part-time. But when you do that, you don't get to pay into uh, um, a retirement system anywhere. So I went, got my master's degree. I have a job I'm very happy with now. Um, but I will never be able to, you know, build a, a, a good retirement in the amount of time I have till I retire. So it's very appealing, you know, the, the plans that you're talking about, because I'll be quite dependent on um, Social Security. Yeah. So um, that's... Set aside a little money, watch it grow at a better rate than the current Social Security system. Exactly. So that, um, so for, certainly for Jeremy and for my other three sons, it, you know, as you said, that it would make me happy to know that they're taken care of too and that they would have options. Right. And how's old Jeremy doing? I'm doing good. Huh? <laughs> Tell him where you're born. Tomball, Texas. <laughs> Tom Ball, Texas. Right outside of Houston. Yep. Uh, so you got grandmom here, you got mom here. Got the brother out in the audience. Got one the of the, one of the three's out in the audience. Yeah. Other grandparents. Yep. Good. And so, what do you even, like, first of all, what are you doing with yourself these days? Well, I'm 18. I'm a sophomore at Canisius College in Buffalo. Um, And, uh, What's actually, your major? Hmm? Major? Um, dual majoring in business marketing and business management. Great. 
Yeah. All A's? Yeah. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> well, don't worry about it. That won't disqualify you for being president. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, get going, will you? <laughs> All right, well, being the younger generation, I'm just starting to pay into the system. I like the idea of having these personal accounts, getting a better rate of return in the end, and um, compound interest and everything, so I build up something for myself that can leave for my future kids and everything. And I like the fact that I'll have something to show for it, because people go and pay decades and decades into Social Security, and when it comes time for me to retire, if we don't change, I'll have nothing to show for it. Yeah. So You know what's interesting? I, I, I say this a lot when I travel around the country, is that a lot of young people think it's more likely they'll see a UFO than a Social Security check. <laughs> what do you think, Jeremy? I don't know. I'd rather see the Social Security change. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't ask your preference. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a lot of young people who, when they listen to the debate and understand the demographic shift that's gone on, uh, don't think they're going to see anything. And what kind of system is that where you got a young guy getting ready to graduate from college paying, into a, paying a payroll tax, a hefty payroll tax, into a system where he doesn't think he's going to see any benefits from it? It's a system that sounds like to me is screaming for reform. So that somebody who contributes into the system not only knows they're taking care of a, a baby boomer generation or doing their part for the retirement, but also will have something left over for his family in this case. What do you want to do when you get out of college? Uh, go into real estate. Real estate, yeah, good. Sounds like to me you understand finances pretty well too. <laughs> that money can grow over time. Yep. Anybody, uh, any other 18-year-olders uh, that you know worried about this issue, thinking about the issue? Uh, they are now. I got him informed. Yeah, you do. That's good. Good job. It's important for people Jeremy's age to start listening to this discussion. As Tim said, the longer we wait, the more difficult it's going to be for an up-and-coming generation. Well, this is a generational issue, folks. See, the grandmoms and granddads around America now understand they're going to get their check. And so once that comfort level has been provided, the next logical question from many of the grandmothers I've talked to is, what you going to do about my grandson? You've said there's a problem, Mr. President. I expect you and the United States Congress to make sure that my grandson has got a viable retirement system. That's what a lot of people are beginning to say around America. And that's why I can predict that once we get through on this issue, once I finish traveling the country, and I got a lot more to do, people are gonna start demanding from their representatives and their senators a solution. They don't want any Washington double talk. What they want is a solution. So a grandmother can then look at her son, her grandson Jeremy and say, thankfully, people in Washington did their duty and I can rest easy knowing I'm gonna get my check and Jeremy's gonna get his as well. That's the issue. Good job. You did great. You two look alike. These are the Wetzel girls, McKenna and Riley. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay. Which one's Riley? That makes you McKenna. That's true. <laughs> uh, they're twins. I'm the father of twins. I am a white-haired father of twins. You can do that, too. Uh, did you do the same thing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, tell me what you all do. Well, I'm a history teacher at Bread of Life Christian Academy here in Rochester. Fabulous. Thanks for teaching. Yeah. I teach history to the fourth through seventh graders there. And Great. Hi, guys. I love you and I miss you and I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> be good. And, uh, Taking advantage of C-SPAN. <laughs> Good 
And I um, am getting married in this summer in August, and um, my fiance and I are uh, just starting to think about retirement and about our you know, future generations, and hopefully if God blesses us with kids, our kids, and something we can pass on down to them. And we're really excited about your plan and that we can set up personal accounts and then watch compound interest grow and hopefully get a nest egg and be able to hand that down to our kids. So. Fantastic. I don't remember thinking about compound interest growing when I was 23. Do you think <laughs> There wasn't a lot of discussion about that type of issue. There's a, there's a change. There's a cultural change in, in America when it comes to investment. And it's because a lot of people are now getting used to the concept of watching their own money grow. Isn't that right? Is there a fiancé here? Yeah, he's right over there, Ben. <laughs> ben, look at him. Fine-looking lad. Thanks. I think so, too. Yeah. <laughs> August is the wedding? August 6th. You're invited. <laughs> <laughs> That's a smart move. <laughs> she knows I won't come, but I will send a gift. <laughs> uh, McKenna going to be in the wedding? McKenna is my maid of honor, of course. Cool. McKenna, what do you do? I'm a hairdresser at the Scott Miller Salon in Pittsburgh, New York. Great. Good. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful place to work. A lot of talk about Social Security? <laughs> Not a whole lot there, but honestly, I've been thinking about it. That'd be um, good. Yeah, definitely. I feel like there's definitely a problem in the system right now, and things need to change. And I want to say that it's completely commendable of you to, to stand up and tackle this issue. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. That's my job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that. It's, uh, a lot of others in Washington feel the same way I feel, that, uh, you know, there's... No, they say, are you taking a risk? How can you be taking a risk when you're doing what the people expect? <laughs> Solving problems. I think the people who take the risk are those who won't come to the table to discuss the issue in a, in a way that will help solve the problem. Uh, so do you agree with Riley on personal accounts? Or? I certainly do. I feel like being able to take more ownership over your future and over your investments is yeah. very wise. Yeah. You know, don't you like the idea, I mean, some of you have got 401ks and, and you open up your uh, statement on a quarterly basis. It seems like to me that would be a healthy thing for our country if more and more people are opening up a statement that says, this is what you're worth, uh, this is how your worth has grown. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a notion of getting people to understand that they got to pay attention to the future of the country when you, on a monthly basis, some cases on a daily basis, if you want to get on the internet and look at your, look at your asset base. Um, now you're contributing into the, both of you, payroll tax. Yeah, we yeah. both currently are. Pretty good sized chunk? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> no, pretty good sized chunk of your payroll tax. Oh, of course. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. I think the interesting thing is that when you first talk to people entering into the workplace, uh, their reaction on when they first get their checks, what, is, what, what, what the reaction, what it's like uh, to not have quite as much money as you expected. Did that happen to you? Yeah, that was a shocker. <laughs> yeah. In other words, government tends to take out a pretty good chunk. Mm -hmm. And it seems like to me that a significant chunk that is being taken out ought to at least uh, be able to say to the young kids, there's a reason why it's worthwhile for the money to go out because it'll help me in my retirement age. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we're talking about, isn't it? Definitely. Yes, it is. Okay, now that you've got your kids watching, anything else you want to say? Um, How about you? How about just you, Just be good today, that's all. McKenna? No slips. <laughs> got anything else you need to say? Well, I just also want to state that I feel like it's just encouraging to know that we could collect money in the end, that we aren't hoping that there will be money there, that it truly will be. And also um, just the responsibility of knowing that you're setting aside money and that you will be getting it. See, it's a little lack of trust right now, it sounds like to me. Don't quite trust the government to have a social security system available for, my, for the money I put in. This is a matter of trust. This is a big issue. I want to thank our panelists for coming to discuss this issue. Very good job.
Washington has a duty to earn the trust of the people by making wise decisions about how the people's money will be used. We have a chance, both Republicans and Democrats have a chance to come together and to solve the Social Security issue forever. And when we do, and I believe we will, because the people's voice is gonna resonate on this issue. And when we do, all of us who are fortunate enough to serve this country can look back and say, we did our duty for generations to come. Listen, thank you all for coming. May God bless you all. And may God continue to bless our country. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just been listening to President Bush in a town hall forum on Social Security form here from the Grace Athena High School Performing Arts Center. We are now going to stand up as the president is leaving the stage. A packed house, obviously very well received, some uh, interesting comments from some local folks. And uh, Kurt Smith, uh, He's the president actually going into the crowd right now, shaking some hands. Kurt, did you expect this? Uh, no, but it's been known to happen. Uh, that is that uh, the president is uh, known for having uh, an informality, if you will, an affinity with the audience. And I think that he's shown that in the wake of this speech. Uh, as we had talked about, Kevin, before the speech, not formal, but rather informal, very conversational, almost like a town hall, almost like a talk show host. And he excelled in that today, as he has often during his tenure in the White House. And Mr. Bush now going along the uh, front of the auditorium, greeting people uh, in line. Uh, I see some, a lot of people taking pictures. Well, would you? Ask, yes, of course. Digital or and non digital, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I got to tell My you. My Brownie Starmite <laughs> camera would be applicable for this. But Kurt, I got to say, I was very impressed by his warmth, yes. his hominess. Yes. Um, do you think his message today uh, related to the average person in the Rochester area? I think there are two segments and probably two answers to that. First of all, as you saw for the uh, first half of the uh, show, because that's in essence what it was, where Kevin, you're trying to explain and explain, and he said, repeat, 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 because he has to, because his message has not yet resonated with the American public. It is very technical. There are a lot of things today that I think the average person learned about Social Security. There are things I learned that I had not known before. This is a very detailed and difficult message to convey to the American public, especially when polls show that Democrats, and particularly members of the national press, are somewhat skeptical of that. Very difficult to go above them. Then comes the second half of the, uh, of the uh, show, the program, where the president does become the talk show host, and he was terrific. Much warmer, much more involved with the audience, much better received than he had been earlier. So this is really where he's at his best. Did you hear anything new today that we haven't heard in the other 26 uh, town forums on strengthening Social Security? Well, I learned, for example, and I had not known this. And there, Mr. Bush, waving to the crowd. Now going up into the gold ticket seats. Well, Kevin, I thought you were next. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're in the back. We're in I the see. <laughs> no, I had not known that if a spouse dies before a certain age, he is not allowed to have uh, those earnings go to his wife or husband, whoever survives him. I hadn't known that. These are the kind of human anecdotes, I think, to give some animacy to this issue that the president is going to have to really emphasize. Uh, the crowd standing right now, uh, George Bush has left the auditorium outside getting into his, his motorcade. So uh, you learned that uh, a couple couldn't share their Social Security benefits. That's right. Um, how about anything else that stood out to you that when this plays on the evening news tonight, uh, what anything new going to be reported there? Uh, not in the network news. 
I think, because I think it's going to take a presidential address, perhaps from the Oval Office, this kind of thing, to go national. I was looking today for what I didn't see, and I still don't. What is going to make the Democratic Party, if they can't see the light, feel the heat? They have to feel the heat. They're well, not going to on their own, and I didn't see anything of that. I think the tenor has to change to get Democratic support. Well, Kurt, he said one of his strategies is to hold more of these town forums to have the average Jane and Joe voter apply pressure on their Congress. Yes, I think, but positive pressure is one thing. Negative is another. In other words, Democratic officials have to begin hearing from their voters, look, we're really concerned that the system won't exist, that we won't get the money. Then I think there will be some traction. Okay, Kurt, more from you in a moment. But now, obviously, a huge crowd gathered outside Greece Athena High School, and that's where our Steve Levine is now. Steve? Good morning, Kevin. Yeah, the crowds are still here waiting to see the president leave Greece Athena as he heads off to the airport. We've been with Barb Bishop all morning. Tell us, what'd you think? Wonderful. Just fantastic. A little, little rainy and a little cold, but warm to the heart. And now that the president's here, what kind of host has Greece been? Extraordinary. I think they did their job and they did a, a, a wonderful thing. All right, thank you. And of course, uh, she's been feeding us all morning with the lovely cheese nip sacks, and we certainly appreciate that. As uh, I said, Kevin, the president is making his way into the motorcade. He'll be leaving in the next few minutes, and he'll be heading to the airport, where we will have coverage from Miss Melissa Long in a few minutes. It's been a great, glorious morning here. Folks started showing up about five o'clock this morning when it was raining, downpour wet. Once the president arrived here at Greece Athena, the skies kind of opened up a little bit, dried everybody off, and uh, what's happening now, guys? Starting to rain. Uh, uh, we did get an instant <laughs> commentary and analysis that folks say they were able to see the uh, president as long as they didn't blink, because if you blinked, you missed him. A lot of folks had a great time. They have their signs. There are demonstrators here as well. We'll have all that information coming up on the new news. But we are having a great time here with these folks who are being very kind to us. As I said, we're waiting for the president to leave the uh, Greece Athena Performing Arts Center. Uh, the motorcade showed up yesterday afternoon in a big military plane and that's all going to take off with him. Kevin, we'll send it back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. So the way this is going to work now, then President Bush is getting into his motorcade. Yes. He'll head back to the airport. Uh, the schedule that we were given by the White House is that Air Force One should be in the air by sometime around 1230. That's one of the great things about Air Force One. You never, as in never, have to wait on a tarmac. <laughs> <laughs> and we will show you uh, everything from the airport live in the motorcade leaving as it happened. What about the people that he talked to today? The grandmother from Williamsville, yes. her, uh, her daughter and her son. See, this is what you have to do. You have to personalize it. All the great presidential communicators, really in our time, beginning with Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan, have done precisely that. You really saw the spontaneity and the natural wit of George W. Bush here. Talking, for example, the, uh, the uh, teacher that was uh, talking about her children, and he says, yes, you're taking advantage of C-SPAN. Talking about, if you don't get A's, it doesn't qu yeah. qualify you, got you for the being old president. Softball in, and as the president it. would say, he should certainly know. And then, of course, to use, as he often has, any question about, well, is your mother tough? Is she a disciplinarian? To segue to his mother, the call the enforcer, the beloved Barbara Bush. So, would you have done anything different with this president and his performance today, or would you let him talk from the cuff? I know I he just, has talking I, points. I would let him uh, talk from the from the cuff, from the talking point. Uh, the more informal he is, the better he does. He was superlative in the second half. There still remains the challenge. How do you explain the many arcane and technical aspects of Social Security to the broader nation to let them know what happens if we do not act? He tried to do that today. This is a local forum. He needs to take his act national. Do you think it's still, this is, this is political suicide? for him or somebody who would support him. I don't think, no, I don't think necessarily politically suicide. It is very difficult to do politically because you're, in essence, trying to reform something that has been sacrosanct. Social Security, as the president said, for 70 years. You're going up against the uniform opposition of the opposition party and the skepticism of the national press. Even if he keeps at it, there's no guarantee it will be done. He feels, obviously, from his many references today as president, he has a duty to get it done. But again, I believe after hearing him today, he honestly feels it is his job. Well, I think that's to quite. This, I, this is his mission, his challenge. Sure, and let's on. welcome in Dave McKinley here. Uh, Dave, you've uh, been in the auditorium here listening. Uh, your impressions? Well, uh, 
it was an interesting speech in terms of that the president came out and said it is my job to solve problems now and not voice them on to future generations, but his critics who talk about borrowing to get this whole Social Security revamp uh, um, started. Uh, are saying things like, well, with this borrowing, you are, Mr. President, pushing the problem off to future generations. He didn't bring up the word borrowing, though. He didn't discuss if that's what Nor he Nor privatization. The White House no longer uses that term right. as well. And uh, he also said that uh, you, you should have control of your asset. You don't need Washington telling you what you should do with your money. He said, so we're going to set up this account where you can keep your money, but we're going to give you some guidelines on what you can do with it. So I, I can almost hear the critics saying that there was some doublespeak. There was some self-effacing humor. Probably the best yes. line there was when uh, he was talking to the uh, the, the uh, grandson yep. of uh, the lady from Williamsville. <laughs> and he said, how's your grades? And he said, well, they're not straight A's or something to that effect. And the president said, well, take it from me. You can even be president <laughs> without real good grades. Dave, I, I want to your, your impressions on whether he was able to sell this. Did he sell this to the average person in the Rochester area? Hard to tell because I don't think the average person in the Rochester area was in this audience. Let's remember, it was kind of a stacked deck. So uh, it's, it's very tough to tell. It is hard to tell. The president is making a calculated decision. He can stick with this long enough so that the emphasis changes from, geez, Mr. President, you're jeopardizing Social Security, to the question, why Democrats have you no program. Why are you willing to let this program sink? He thinks if he keeps at it long enough, that will be the debate. As of yet, that is not the debate. And he did say, in my line of work, to someone in the audience, you have to say something over and over and over again for it to sink in. Well, there's uh, there's an opportunity there for a critic. You can almost hear what they might say, that if you repeat something that's not true over and over again, people will believe it. Of course, again, then, even if it weren't true, what's the Democratic response? Because I do think Bush has won that debate. People do now believe, overwhelmingly, there is a problem, and if nothing is done, the, the system itself will But I will think sink. that's the theme that he just hammered home more than anything, well, that we have to do something. I think everyone agrees you have to do something, but the, the, the issue still to be debated, and the issue still that he doesn't have the it, it support. Yeah. Even Congress people in his own party is, how do you fix it? Do you just moderately raise the payroll tax to try and take care of it again? Or is that what he called the 75-year fix that didn't only work for 20 The years? debate and the spotlight now is on Bush's something. He hopes that soon the debate and the spotlight will be on Democrats' nothing in terms of no proposal thus far. Right. Uh, well, in, in either case, it was interesting to see that played out a little bit here. Okay. We're going to be hearing a lot more about it over the, well, not only the days and weeks, but months to come. Yeah. Let's just uh, recap really quickly for our viewers. President George Bush here at the uh, beautiful new Grace Athena Performing Arts Center, a packed house, more than 1,663. True enough. Is the crowd that we were told that this holds today. <laughs> uh, he, President Bush currently uh, on his way to the Rochester Airport where Air Force One will uh, will take off. We are told sometime between 12.15 and 12.30. We are going to carry our coverage over live until wheels are up and Air Force One goes out of sight. But gentlemen, one quick thing. Most surprising thing you saw today? Not surprising but impressive when he gets away from a prepared text. And in a sense, even though he didn't have a manuscript, the first half was prepared. He is very, very good when it comes simply to relating to people. Dave? I didn't see anything really surprising here, Kevin. Frankly, I saw it play out pretty much the way it's played out at these events. This is what, 23, almost two dozen of them now. Yes. So uh, it, it, I didn't see anything surprising. I didn't hear anything I didn't think I'd hear. Uh, it's something we've heard over and over again all across. Audrey Segelski from Williamsville <laughs> was the big surprise for me, the grandmother. I who seemed to have the president right there on the I'm the president, I'm going to take her national. I'm going to put her at every stop I have. Actually, maybe maybe we should give credit to the, the one of the twins that he yes. talked to who <laughs> said she was going to get married and then quickly said, and you're invited. And he said, that's smart because you know I can't make it, but I will send a gift. We will follow up on that's that, great. by the way. Dave and Kurt, we're going to have much more to come, but now we want to go back to the Channel 8 studios and Maureen McGuire. Maureen? All right, thank you, guys. A great job this morning, and the presidential motorcade is about to take off for the airport. We'll be back with more live coverage right after this. During Ford's National Test Drive event, people just love getting into our F-150. Trouble is, getting them out. Boy, it sure is quiet in here. Yep, ready to check out the rest of the truck? Do not open that door. But it's got the highest towing capacity, the biggest payload, even a fully boxed frame welded on both hey. sides. 
I believe you. Now, get into a tough F-150 STX 4x4 for just $1.99 a month. Visit your neighborhood Ford store today. Peace and quiet. Alzheimer's disease. It can be devastating, but is there help? Researchers at the University of Rochester Medical Center are looking for volunteers to test an investigational medicine that may help those with Alzheimer's. Volunteers must have a reliable caregiver to accompany them to study visits. To learn more, call 585-760-6585. Study participants receive a study-related physical exam, memory assessment, and study medications. The Law Office of Donald Blyer with a message about Social Security Disability. Applying for disability benefits can be a nightmare. It, it was so complicated. The hearing was like a trial. You need someone who can go in there and fight for you. My attorney gathered all of my medical history. Don't go it alone. Call for legal help. Call Donald Blyer, 1-866-454-9090. It's a free call, so call. You're watching Muse 8 Now, continuing coverage of a presidential visit. Welcome back, everyone. We are going to go to News 8's Steve Levine, who is standing by along the motorcade route outside Greece Athena High School. And the president has yet to um, get back in the car and go back to the airport. Is that correct, Steve? That's right, Maureen. You know, the sad thing is President Bush is going to think it does nothing but rain here. On his way to the high school, it was raining, it was pouring. He went into the building. It stopped. It got nice for a while. Now it's starting to rain again, but folks are not leaving. They are not moving. They want to see the president leave Greece Athena as he makes his way to the airport before he leaves. Uh, you know, his motorcade arrived yesterday. It came in a big C-5 military jet, had the two limousines, had some big SUVs, had a couple trucks on there with all the equipment and all the material that it ne they needed to put on this production today. As we said, the Secret Service has been here for a week walking around Greece, Athena, talking with folks, putting this all together. A lot of these things have been going on for a couple of days. A lot of folks are still here, and they're not going to leave until the president leaves, and we'll bring that to you in a couple of minutes, Maureen. All right, Steve, and let's go to News 8's Kevin Doran now, who's standing by inside Greece, Athena, where the president wrapped up his speech just about 15 minutes ago. He was warm. He had a very receptive audience. Hey, Maureen, before we do that, though, I want to know what you thought about it. What did you think of the speech? You watched it live. Well, he is very impressive the way he can really connect with an audience. I thought the touch with the panelists was perfect. He really uh, hit his stride. Uh, you know, these are tough things to talk about. Social Security, who wants to talk about money and saving for retirement? Uh, so he did a terrific job. Well, and here live, I have to tell you, you and I have watched President Bush speak many, many times on TV. But to see him in person, and Kurt, I think you'll agree, in front of a live crowd, um, I, I think this is his format. This is where he thrives. Well, you know, if you look at different presidents, John F. Kennedy was terrific at a press conference, at an ad lib speech, at a formal speech. Ronald Reagan, not good at a press conference, terrific otherwise. This president does not like a formal text. He does not like to speak from the Oval Office because there's no human being to bounce off of. He bounces off, well, human beings. And you saw that today, this marvelous interaction, a terrific, a very quick sense of humor, which you never see in his encounter, for example, with the White House press corps. Different universe today, different Bush. Now, a couple of the highlights of his speech today. First of all, he started by uh, commenting on the fact that uh, the Senate's going to go forward with a vote on his judicial nominees. Yes. Obviously, that's an important thing for him. It is important. He likes the decision. A lot of Republicans that I have talked to don't. They think the White House and the Senate cave. Verdict still to be uh, reached in that matter. And then he went on to explain that it, he believes it's his job as President of the United States to, do so, to solve problems. And in, in his book, Social Security is a huge problem. Do you agree? I, I do agree. I also know it's a uh, politically risky uh, venture. I also know that Republicans, unlike him, many are up for re-election next year. And at the next presidential election, which will not involve him, will, elect, will involve the Republican Party. So they have politically more at stake than him. He's got his legacy. He feels that, right or wrongly, that his legacy will be enhanced by this. He does think there's a problem. Politically, however, Somehow this president has to give his party cover. That's what he's looking for today. Okay. Maureen, do you have a question? I do, and I, you know, not to um, switch topics here necessarily, but I'm wondering, 
Kevin, if you are, if you know whether the president had a chance to meet with the parents of uh, Marine Lance Corporal uh, Keith Marine, Strand. I just lost your audio. I apologize for that. Okay, well, hopefully we'll... And uh, <laughs> it's being that, dialed as we speak. That's um, happened to some politicians. You know, they lose their video. <laughs> this is a good opportunity for us until we get our audio back to remind you that you are watching WROC TV 8, Rochester, New York. We're coming up on noon. You are watching continuing coverage of the live uh, Social Security Reform uh, town meeting being held here at the Performing Arts Center at Greece Athena High School. Uh, Maureen, I've got you back now. Uh, there we go. We're ready to go. What was what were you saying again, please? I wondered if you knew whether the president had a chance at all to meet with the parents of Marine Lance Corporal Keith Schramm, who died in Iraq. He's from Greece. This is a family from Greece. Do you know anything about that at all? All I can tell you is that I believe it was on the agenda. We did need did not see them here in the Performing Arts Center, nor did he make mention of them during his visit. And I would have been surprised, Kevin and Marine, if he had. This has happened, obviously, and very sadly, in other locales around the country. But what the president has done is respectfully and respectedly pay grief and pay homage to the son or daughter by meeting privately with the parents. So do you and think I'm that's... Guessing, I'm guessing that's what occurred here. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I, I was... Too, I, I do know that he had a chance to meet with some of the people he recognized in the audience today ahead of time, and perhaps that's what accounted for the delay of actually coming into the Performing Arts Center. He did yeah. start about 1045, which was about five minutes behind schedule. Yeah. And that would make sense. I'm assuming that that is indeed what happened, uh, not necessarily to make mention um, of that during his speech, but to meet individually with the parents. Yeah, that's... And that, and that would be very in keeping. This president does not like to make a grandstand, if you will, exhibition of someone else's grief. And I would bet anything that he met with them privately today. Yeah. Um, All right. Uh, Kurt Smith standing okay. by and uh, Kevin Doran. We are still waiting to uh, see what's happening with the president's motorcade along 390. We'll have that in just for you in just a moment. Stay right there. Save money, simplify your life, and have fun too with All-in-One and Roadrunner. With Roadrunner, you get features DSL can't touch, like video mail, anti-spam software, and security features to protect your computer. Plus, download speeds 66% faster than Frontier DSL. Save money every month on internet access when you get Roadrunner and All-in-One together on one simple bill at one low price. So join the thousands who have made All-in-One a part of their lives. Call today. Rochester's local TV channels and Dish Network are now joined together, bringing you a new television service choice. Get Dish Network's Best 60 channels, CBS Channel 8, and your other local channels all in razor-sharp digital for just $24.97 monthly. That's less than $25 for everything. Good for a whole 12 months. That includes multiple TVs connected. There is no equipment to buy and free standard professional installation. Now let us really knock your socks off. You can get upgraded to a digital video recorder for free. Record your favorite shows right to your Dish Network system. Pause your show at any time and more. It's all included and it's still less than $25. We can't stress enough the limited time availability of this package. Call the Dish Activations line directly at 1-888-882-DISH. 1-888-882-DISH and get in on this while it's available. 1-888-882-DISH. Get a great new look at Naples Greek Shoes and Leather. Color, color, color. Uggs in all kinds of color. Check out these new looks. Dasco, new look. Birkenstock, hip new look. Nayots from Israel, international new look. And introducing Chaco Sandals Earth Footwear and the newest sensation Crocs. You gotta try them on. Women's comfort cotton clothing and all kinds of accessories. A great fitting shoe makes for a happy day at Naples Creek Shoes and Leather. Shown place in Pittsburgh. This is the WROC-TV News 8 Now special report, a presidential visit. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Maureen McGuire. And I'm Kathy Orris. Rochester gave a rousing welcome to the President of the United States today. We are going to be in our team coverage at noon with News 8's Kevin Doran, who is at Greece Athena High School, where the President uh, wrapped up his speech about 20 minutes ago.
Uh, Maureen and Kathy, it has been a great morning for Greece and the entire Rochester region. President Bush bringing, bringing his Social Security reform tour to the town, a packed house here at the Greece Athena High School, beautiful new performing arts center. And one of the people who has been on the front end of this whole thing uh, <laughs> since, since it began last week is Dick Snyder, the uh, principal of Greece Athena Middle School. Yeah. Uh, and so when you got the call last week, uh, the Secret Service was coming in town. You've been meeting with them since day one, correct? That that's correct. Actually, when I, I first heard about it Wednesday afternoon, and uh, when the superintendent was explaining it, I actually turned to the person next to me and thought it was a joke. He's, he's really, <laughs> but it turns out, uh, yes, they've been here since Wednesday. Okay, Dick, and we apologize, had a little video problem there, but we are back now. Uh, okay. So, uh, it, how did things go today? Uh, I think things went very smoothly. When you think of the logistical effort that comes to bringing the national media here, bringing all the Secret Service and security personnel for the president, and then getting all these people in here. It went very, very smoothly. I'm very pleased with how it happened. Uh, you were one who actually greeted the president when he arrived at the school. What was that experience like? Uh, hard to describe. Uh, I have a great admiration for the president, of course, and um, not knowing what to say was, was a real issue, but he's such a comfortable person. What did you say? Well, I, of course, you're welcome to Athena. I talked a little bit about, we've talked a little bit about middle school education because it has a pretty unique place. And then I took the opportunity to uh, talk to my daughter, Elizabeth. Uh, in, in what regard? Well, Elizabeth just finished her freshman year at Boston College, and she has a Bush Cheney poster on the wall in Boston College, which is a heavily Democratic area. And so uh, he, he got a kick out of that and said, well, that's one strong supporter. And I said, you bet she is. Okay, Mr. Snyder, thank you so much. Uh, great job today. Appreciate okay. you hosting. It was a great Appreciate point. you hosting us. Now let's, let's head outside to News 8's Steve Levine, who's been covering the supporters and the demonstrations all day long. Steve. Kevin, folks have been here all morning. They started arriving around 5 o'clock this morning to see the president. Folks are lined up along Long Pond Road for miles, waving flags and showing banners. It was a sea of signs and flags as the presidential motorcade flew through through Greece. People of all ages came out for the historic glimpse of this president, and boy, was it brief. We saw him as he was waving out the window. It was really exciting. I can't believe that we got to see it, and he waved, and we waved back to him. Yeah, I saw two limos. It came by, it was mad fast, and that's it. Now, they all weren't fans of the president. Dozens of demonstrators showed up. One protester, Nazareth College Professor Henry, Harry Murray, was hauled away by police officers. We talked to him this morning after being warned once by the cops. They said that that's a presidential zone of protection. So I said that for the moment I would move over here. Um, I'm not sure what I'll do as time rolls on. Because you know they'll be watching you. Well, I, I assume that they will. And once again, folks are here lined up along Long Pond Road waiting to say farewell to President Bush as he heads to the airport. And Kevin, when that happens, we will bring it to you. Okay, Steve Levine outside Greece Athena High School, thank you very much. I'm joined now by our political analyst, Kurt Smith, who's been uh, helping us out all morning long. Uh, the most surprising thing you found about President Bush's appearance here today? Well, I've seen this before, but there's an enormous contrasted economy between the stilted Bush that you see reading a speech or dealing with a White House press conference and how expansive and generous and good he is on his feet. He was superlative today, very quick, very adroit, very able to encapsulate some very technical arguments once he started dealing with people. He needs people to bounce off. He found that in the second half of the show today. And for those viewers who are just joining us now for our new news, news Kurt, uh, did he get the message home? Well, he did to this audience, and uh, he may have to the audience uh, listening in the Rochester area. What he needs to do, though, is to do this nationally, and that's the great challenge, how to do that. Okay, now we want to take a look outside real quick. Uh, apparently, the president's motorcade uh, is approaching, and uh, Steve Levine, are you there? Yes, Kevin, the President's Motorcade is approaching. Uh, as you can see, the Sheriff's Department uh, car, as long as Greece police are escorting President Bush and his motorcade out of Greece Athena High School. Uh, as you can see, there are SUVs loaded with uh, politicians and uh, folks who were there with the President as he traveled from the airport this morning. They now will head back to the airport where the President will get on Air Force One and uh, presumably head back to Washington. Very much, Steve. And we can still hear the demonstrators there outside. Uh, this has been quite an event for everyone here, anyone associated with Greece Athena High School.
And there goes the President's Motorcade. As I was saying, this has been quite an event for anyone associated with Greece Athena High School. Nobody more impacted than really the students here. Now, Katrina Irwin has been following that all story, story all day long, and she's joined now by a guest. Katrina, take it away. Thank you, Kevin. That's right. About 50 students got to watch this firsthand. One of them, Paul Scholl, who is a senior here at Greece Athena. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So what did you think about what the president had to say? I thought it was very interesting. He brought some good ideas to the table. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but the fact is he's bringing stuff to the table for us to explore and uh, consider. Um, I think there's better options out there, but that's just my own opinion. Okay, well thank you very much. I'm glad you got to see this, and I'm sure we'll be talking with more students coming up a little later on. And uh, we were losing our signal there, so I think to be safe on the safe side, sure. let's go back to our studio right now and Maureen McGuire, and, and we'll take it from there. Maureen? All right, actually, it's Kathy Cow. Thank you so much. Great job oh, down Kath, there. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll see you back here at 5 and 6 tonight. Now, Maureen has more analysis. That's right. Uh, joining us now is financial expert George Convoy, who has been with us all morning. You watch the uh, president's speech, George. Join us now from the newsroom. George, of course, is with Brighton Securities. George, what kind of job do you think the president's doing in selling this Social Security reform? Well, Maureen, it's early, and certainly signs are from the public that there's not broad support for this, but you have to give him credit. Politicians tend not to want to tackle difficult issues, and this is a very difficult issue to bring up, and the fact that they're having this conversation is a good sign. Yeah, it's a lot of people are, are stingy when it comes to money and retirement and saving for retirement. Uh, why do you think people are so scared if that's what's happening now about the president's proposal? Well, anytime there's uncertainty, people are going to be scared. And right now, Social Security says you'll get a check for X amount, and that's a certain thing. If there's any change in that, some people will be worried about it or nervous. Uh, and George, uh, you, you know, actually this is going to be up to Congress anyway. We're ultimately waiting for Congress to make a move here. Do you really see this happening? I mean, we heard today these are ideas that have been tossed around since 1983. Well, there's a parallel right now, Maureen, in the financial markets, and I think people are cognizant of that, and that's why they're paying attention to this issue. Social Security in the future will have what I call a General Motors problem. Right now, most people are aware that General Motors has two and a half retirees drawing benefits for every person working on the line, and that's caused a big problem with GM financially, where one worker is attempting to generate enough in the way of sales and profits to support two and a half retirees. We don't want to get to a point where Social Security is like that, and dealing with it now may help prevent that problem. Okay, so George, what do you advise middle class workers especially who are listening to the rhetoric, trying to gather information to make up their own minds about this very contentious issue? What do you advise us in terms of saving and Social Security and the like? Well, I think middle class workers are already aware of the fact that if they expect to have the comfortable retirement that their own parents and grandparents had, that they need to save, and many people do that through 401ks. Important thing to do now is pay attention to the press. I think watching Channel 8 is a great idea to get the information you need to follow this debate as it works its way through Congress. How's that for a plug? George Convoy from Brighton Securities, always a pleasure to talk to you. And thanks for being so patient waiting with us this morning. Pleasure to be here, Maureen. All right. George Convoy from Brighton Securities has watched the speech. He's been with us since mm -hmm. 10, so it was a great idea. And his advice to keep watching Channel 8 was great <laughs> advice as Good well. Good friend. We will have much more analysis on the president's visit today right here on News 8 Now at Noon. Stay with us. Save money, simplify your life, and have fun, too, with All-in-One and Digital Cable. With Digital Cable, you get features Dish Can't Match, on-demand programming so you can watch what you want, when you want, movies you can pause and rewind, access to a great selection of high-definition channels, and service that works in all types of weather. Save money every month when you get Digital Cable and All-in-One together. Only from Time Warner Cable. Call today. Patrick, Rochester's number one volume Pontiac GMC dealer announces a blockbuster event. You clip it, we'll beat it. Starting now, if you're in the process of buying a new Pontiac or GMC from any one of our competitors, know this, Patrick will beat any advertised sale price in the country. Yes, the country. Just clip their ad and bring it in. Patrick will beat any deal, period. Patrick, we are professional grade on West Henrietta Road next to Marketplace Mall. We're going to sell a lot of Pontiacs and GMCs. This is News 8 Now at noon. See the difference with Melissa Long and Rob Haswell with Weather on the 8s. 
And welcome back, everyone. Continuing coverage of the president's visit to Rochester. His motorcade is now making its way down 390 on its way back to Air Force One, which has been parked at the airport. Uh, let's go to News 8's Melissa Long, who is standing by at the airport. It's been quite a scene there, I imagine. It, very much so. And it's nice to see the sun come out at, for this afternoon as the president arrives back at the airport. Air Force One, as you see, is behind me. And I want to introduce you this afternoon to the CEO of U.S. Airports. You just had an opportunity to be on Air Force One. You've been on many planes in your life. Yes, what was it like? It's quite an experience. Uh, it's like no other aircraft I've ever been on, and I've been in aviation for the past 35 years. I've never had a chance to be on Air Force One. Yeah. Uh, we're only the second group that has been allowed to go on Air Force One uh, civilians since 9-11. Yeah. Uh, uh, the security have been tightened down, and you can only get on with, a, with an invitation. Interesting. Well, Anthony, obviously you had the invitation, and I want to tell everybody what you got on Air Force One for your nine grandchildren. Want to show everybody? What yeah, is absolutely. it? Absolutely. Nine grandchildren are each going to receive a commemorative bottle, a box of M&Ms with uh, the president's signature and seal on it. Now, you have a sweet tooth. Are you going to take one of those? Uh, I might. <laughs> if I take one out of every box, I get nine M&Ms. There you go. Thanks so much for your oh, time this welcome. afternoon. I know you've been very busy for the last few days. Uh, thanks so it. much for your time. I want to tell you something interesting also about Anthony and his story. He got a call from the Secret Service. Actually, his secretary called him on Thursday. The Secret Service was waiting in his office, Maureen, and they wanted to talk to him about the pending presidential visit. Of course, <laughs> it wouldn't be until Friday that we would get official word from the White House that he was, in fact, coming to town. And what an honor for him today to yeah, be able to totally give the souvenirs to the family as well. Mm -hmm. Melissa, keep us posted at the airport as the presidential Will motorcade do. arrives, and we'll talk to you in just a moment. Well, nice to see the sun finally starting to peak out there. It certainly <laughs> hasn't been good weather for a presidential visit. Rob has an update on the forecast when we come back right after this. How do you live well? well? Everyone has their own plan to live healthier, and at News 8 Now, our Live Well 8 program is all about you, helping you to live well with helpful advice from the healthcare professionals at Preferred Care. Be well with delicious and nutritious recipes from Birds on Foods, and Live Well 8 reports on the 8th of the month on News 8 Now, plus a website dedicated to helping you live well. We've got your prescription to good health with a Live Well 8, a partnership between Birds Eye Foods, Preferred Care, and News 8 Now. We are committed, the counties, the state, and the Oneida Nation of New York to stand together to make sure that any effort the Oneida of Wisconsin bring to try to disrupt people in central New York. The state once said that they weren't going to negotiate with out-of-state tribes, and then they come up with this deal. Out-of-state tribes coming in here all of a sudden saying, hey, now we have an interest. The large amount of money is going to go to Wisconsin. It's certainly not going to stay in New York State. So tell your state senator to say no deal to the Pataki out-of-state tribes deal. Netsman's Appliances Red Tag Savings are going on now. Save on all major appliances now through the end of May. Netsman's has a huge selection of appliances and the largest parts department in the area. Netsman's has been in business for over 85 years, bringing you the best appliances and service in Rochester. Stop into Netsman's today and take advantage of extended interest-free financing and special Red Tag Savings on all appliances. Historic Wellsboro, Pennsylvania is known for its gaslit boulevards and beautiful Victorian homes. Step back in time while you steal away for a weekend getaway or a family vacation. Enjoy comfortable and modern accommodations. Spend your days hiking and biking the rail trail, fishing or swimming in our area lakes or streams, or simply enjoying the scenic beauty of the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. So relax, take a break, and refresh yourself in Wellsboro. Do you got the auto sales right here on Empire Boulevard right off the 590? You talk about Cadillacs, we got lots of them. Hey, let's look at the specials for this week. How about this? A 98. This is the DeVille's, the Concourse model, $199 a month. How about this? Beautiful El Dorado, black on black. It's got a top, 37,000 miles, 2669,000. How about this? Here's a 99. It's another Concourse, $189 a month. And take a look at this. Here's a beautiful SLS. $249 a month, it's only one place. The Agardi Auto Sale. Well, we may not have had the best presidential welcoming weather, but 
This is Rochester and this is what you get. I hope you enjoyed it in this short visit. Let's take a look at the Doppler network and we had some showers rolling through during the course of the morning. Things are still going in a very scattered fashion right across western New York and will continue in that fashion throughout the course of the afternoon. Temperatures right now in the upper 40s and low 50s and we're not likely to see much warming from there. It's also kind of breezy with an east northeasterly wind now at 23 miles per hour. So that makes it feel certainly rather raw with the damp cold feel to the air. We'll see low to mid 50s for the high today. Well off the seasonal average, a typical daytime high for this date will be closer to 70, 72 degrees. Now overnight tonight we are going to see mostly cloudy conditions with a chance of showers for tomorrow. Bit of sunshine working its way into the forecast and the same for Thursday, but generally speaking, not a major improvement. The big picture shows this low just sitting and spinning over our area. It will take some time before we can break up that pattern, a pattern that's referred to as a Rex block, and that just kind of keeps things going day after day. A little breakdown in that though as we look at our Stormwatch 8-5 day forecast for Wednesday and Thursday. So we will get some sunshine in middle to upper 60s, but then right back to the showers for Friday and Saturday. We'll be back in a bit with another look at what's going on, guys. All right, you All said right. earlier alphabetically anyway it was fitting. Gray, wet, and breezy. <laughs> GWB. GWB. Right. Worked out to the letter. Yeah, the president has traveled all over the country. I'm sure he's seen weather like this. We've got a beautiful little region, and we're mm -hmm. glad he was Absolutely. here today. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Let's go to News 8's Dave McKinley. You were standing by at Greece Athena High School, and Dave, you had, had a chance to uh, survey the crowd. A very warm response from that audience Yeah, it today. was, it, and it was a day that uh, nobody here will soon forget, Maureen. In fact, uh, I could tell you, some young ladies here, uh, they won't forget this because they have a souvenir. What, what do you got there, young lady? Autographed ticket from George Bush. Okay, can you hold it still for us so our, our camera guy can see? Now, this was your ticket to get in here. Yes. So how did you get up to see him sign it? Well, him our it. principal told us that when George Bush said, God bless us all, that we should run up to the... Um, stage. You rushed him? You guys rushed him? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and how did you avoid the Secret Service? We just <laughs> ran up there and we stuck our um, tickets, tickets out. out and he signed it and for he us. he happily did. So you've got something forever here, huh? Yep. Oh, that's pretty cool stuff. And you with a dollar bill. Yes, I have a dollar bill. Um, my All ticket right. got misplaced. So. Hey, listen, thanks a lot, guys. I understand the presidential motorcade is now arriving at the airport, and that's where News 8 Now's Melissa Long is standing by live. Melissa. Dave, thank you very much. I want to get out of the way so you can see the motorcade as it arrives here at the airport this afternoon. I want to tell you something interesting, and I learned about this fleet that you're looking at. We have two bulletproof limousines and three cars that came from Washington, D.C. on a military jet yesterday. I was told today that those bulletproof limousines are so heavy, if you were to drive one on a tennis court, it would sink. Right in front of us now, the President of the United States arriving in that bulletproof limousine. In front of Air Force One, the 747. According to the CEO of USA Airports, the first 747 to land here in Rochester, New York. I am told that in the past the president has not spent much time on the tarmac. He will likely, if the past is an indication of the present, get immediately on Air Force One. Air Force One is an interesting aircraft. It is modified for presidential requirements. There are two in the presidential fleet. They are Boeing 747s. Prior to 1990, they were Boeing 707s. There's the president. And it looks like he is actually just about ready to get on board Air Force One today. As I began to tell you a moment ago, there are two 747s in the fleet. And whether or not the president is on this plane or another jet, of the two or on any Air Force jet. They are called Air Force One. It's the radio call sign Air Force One. So this has been a monumental moment for Rochester, of course, having the president, first sitting president in Rochester since 1989. President Bush getting ready to leave Rochester after this visit. I do want to tell you something in terms of our programming. Because of the rain today and the jet spray, the Secret Service is going to force all of us, all media, to go inside momentarily when this 747 does a 180 and turns around. So we will have to all go inside and we won't be able to show you the uh, plane turning around and then we will be able to show you the takeoff a little bit later today. So I will check back in with you momentarily when we're able to show you 
the 747 taking off from Rochester. All right, the uh, local congressional Republican delegation on board with the president. No doubt they will be trying to talk to the president today about some of the issues of pressing concern right here at home. And uh, Melissa Long is standing by at the airport, who's on her way to um, be shushed away by the Secret Service. So we'll uh, have more on that in just a moment and stay right there. Continuing coverage of the president's visit to Rochester right after this. Alzheimer's disease. It can be devastating, but is there help? Researchers at the University of Rochester Medical Center are looking for volunteers to test an investigational medicine that may help those with Alzheimer's. Volunteers must have a reliable caregiver to accompany them to study visits. To learn more, call 585-760-6585. Study participants receive a study-related physical exam, memory assessment, and study medications. In the hustle and bustle of everyday life, it's hard to find a company that you can trust. Better Business Bureau members pledge to stand behind their products and services. Next time you're choosing a company, you'll want the Better Business Bureau's Consumer Guide. Available at these businesses or online. Sponsored by ABR Masonry, COP Security, Crawford Funeral Home, Fashionable Fireplaces, L&L Transmissions. Spend money with confidence and remember to check with the Better Business Bureau first. Roofing problem? Solve it right. Go to GAF Master Elite Roofing Contractor. Factory trained and certified, installing the Weather Stopper System. Absolutely your safest choice. The Golden Pledge Limited Warranty 100% protection against roof repairs due to material or installation defect for a full 12 years. Backed by GAF America's largest roofing contractor. Call Eagle now and receive a $500 to $2,500 model gift certificate with any full roofing job. Call 8 on your side at 224-8888, extension 123. Tackling your problems, taking your side, getting results on News 8 Now every day. During Ford's National Test Drive event, people just love getting into our focus. Trouble is getting them out. Okay, left here into the dealership. Cool. Uh, your, uh, the other left. I'm just point next time or dealership, dealership. You know, Focus has a performance tuned suspension. And here it comes and there it goes. Lucky for us, it gets over 30 miles per gallon. We've missed the dealership like five times now. I think that's six. Now get 2,000 cash back on Ford Focus plus an automatic transmission at no extra charge. That's over 2,800 in savings. Visit your local Ford store today. Jack, we're starting to stink. This is News 8 Now. Now, welcome back to our continuing coverage of the President's visit to Rochester today. Kevin Doran had a front row seat. Hi, Kev. Hi, Kath. Hi, Maureen. This has actually been an incredible experience. It just doesn't happen that often when the President of the United States visits your community and we have an opportunity to carry the whole thing live and bring it to our viewers. I'm joined by our political analyst, Kurt Smith, and, and of course, reporter Dave McKinley. And Kurt, first of all, let's just touch on the enormity of this task. I know he was in and out in about two hours, but a lot went into it. Enormity is a good word. Gargantuan is another. Uh, I know from past experience just the scope, the logistics, thousands of little things that have to be done right. And if one is is not, it's the one that people remembered. Guess what? These folks were perfect. What a wonderful way to inaugurate this Performing Arts Center. Uh, not a bad thing to have the President it's, of the United States correct. as your guest. And Greece Athena was worthy of the guest. This is put together in five to six days. It was put together flawlessly by the people here. And we are right now waiting for the departure of Air Force One at the Rochester Airport. And Dave, while I'm we're waiting... I'm always looking for a good story. And yes. I think I just got the one of the day here. <laughs> Has to do with Kate Brown now. She's the little Lager, the girl from Oakfield who pitched the perfect game who everyone in the world has heard about. We told you she was going to be here, and we told you the president might recognize her, and you saw live on television that he did. Here's what you didn't know. Backstage, she had met him. He gave her an autographed baseball. Autographed by the president. We think, maybe, if we could editorialize, it's the least he could have done, because Kate brought with her today the ball she used to pitch that perfect game and the Secret Service wouldn't let it in. Oh, it took, say it didn't happen. And they're still trying they, to get the ball back. And they uh, took Kate away from her parents because she was going to meet the president. The, and they put her on a windowsill, you know, she said. And the parents were going nuts. They're like, where's our daughter? Where's the baseball? You know? <laughs> and so they took it. They, like, Did they get the ball back? They, they're still looking for the ball. They're, they're trying to get it back. It's they, probably they been it. sent to Cooperstown. I'll yeah. tell you, the Secret Service is a tough-minded lot, <laughs> yeah. and, and understandably so. But she did get one from the president, which he signed. Yeah. So. My, my favorite story of the day, uh, Rob, 
Riley McKenna, uh, excuse me, Riley Wetzel, a teacher at the Bread of Life Christian Academy. Uh, one, she and her sister uh, McKenna, the twins, on the stage with the president, and she talked about how she's getting married, and she said, but you're invited to my wedding. And the president laughed and says, well, it's a very smart thing for you to do because you know I can't come to the wedding, but you know I will send a present. I just talked to Riley uh, just a minute ago, and you'll see her on the news tonight, and she will tell you she is convinced that he will send a gift uh, because they took all her personal information. So she does expect the president well, to send a gift. I did suggest, though, that perhaps <laughs> Laura Bush should pick it out, and she thought, yeah, that'd probably be a good idea. After this publicity, how could he not send a gift? Of course, and of course, Riley and McKenna, good examples of how uh, this audience was, was pretty well handpicked. How did Riley become part of this? She has some friends who are work in the Republican Party, and they put her name in, and it was drawn, and she thinks they had to do with this fact she and her sister are twins. Maybe that made Mr. Bush more comfortable, although he said he is the gray-haired father of twins. Okay. So maybe he's not so comfortable. Great, great, great turning anymore. to white. <laughs> yes. And finally, Kurt, any, what are your thoughts about, about just the day as, in general? Well, I, I think any time the president of the United States comes to any locale, the locale is honored. And Rochester and Greece were today Monroe County, Western New York. I think when the event is so spectacular and flawless, I think that, uh, that kudos are doubled. And I think anyone, even minutely involved with this uh, spectacular, because that's what it was, should feel today inordinately proud. The president winging his way back in Air Force One to Washington, D.C. will have a terrific impression, I am sure, of this area and based on today, rightly should. And Dave, it was an honor despite the fact it was a very orchestrated political event, it sure. was an honor for our community. Well, it's the President of the United States, folks, that's a leader of the free world, and uh, he was right here in our town uh, on our time. Okay, and then my final thought would have to be that he came here saying he had a job to do. His job as President was to solve problems. He has not solved all the problems of Social Security, but I thought he very clearly laid out his plans of what he wants to accomplish, and I think he asked for the help of the people in the audience to apply pressure on their congressmen to help him get that job done. Well, the, the, the president reads his Bible, and he doubtless is familiar with the story of the patience of Job. He was saying today he will have that kind of patience. We will see to what effect. Okay. Well, Dave. Uh, Kurt, thank you very much. More thank from you. both of you later on in our coverage. And uh, Kathy and Maureen, let's go back to you in the studio for now. All right, and of course, we'll have much more on the president's visit to Rochester tonight at 5, 6, and 11. Thank you very much, Kevin, Kurt, and Dave, as well as the rest of the crew at the airport in the long 390. A big morning. A big morning indeed. <laughs> and again, as you mentioned, more news tonight at 5, 6, and 11. That's it for us this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching News 8 Now at Noon. If you know of a news story or see breaking news, call pound 888, a free call on your Verizon wireless cell phone, or email us at newsroom at WROCTV.com. want to share this moment with you as the 747 as Air Force One is preparing to leave Rochester and USA airports. Not you're sure if you can say way off in the distance there. That is Air Force One, the 747 that touched down earlier this morning. If you check your watch perfectly on schedule, according to the White House, he touched down this morning right on schedule 1015, just about 1230 right now, and the president is heading back to Washington. It's a slow crawl on what is a rather short runway for this massive aircraft. And we are just watching as this very large 747 gets ready to leave Rochester. The crowd that assembled earlier today has pretty much dissipated. There were many airport personnel here coming out to snap digital photographs of Air Force One with themselves and, and some family members that they were able to, to bring by today. And it was a really uh, momentous occasion for those that had a chance to wave at the president, perhaps receive a wave back, and those that were able to get close enough to Air Force One to show just how immense it, it really is and how impressive it is in stature as well. I am told 
this is not official, but I was told by one Secret Service agent that this aircraft will take off at 630 miles per hour. Again, this is a massive plane really the largest Boeing produces right now. It's a wingspan 195 feet. It's known as a model number of 747-200B. And as we've been discussing all morning and this afternoon, when President Bush Sr. was in Rochester in 1989, he arrived on a 707. That was a Boeing as well. But that 707 was used by seven sitting presidents over a span of 30 years. And then in 1990, it was the 747 that was used by presidents since 1990. I spoke with the airport director, CEO of U.S. Airports today, and they said they were just elated to see that it was actually possible to have Air Force One land here because of its size, because of its stature. And uh, can't show that to you right now because I don't want to take our camera off the runway right now, but still on the runway is that military C-5 that touched down on Monday with the motorcade inside. And of course, the presidential bulletproof limousine will be taking off momentarily as well. Kevin, I understand Melissa, you're still standing Ke by? Yeah, we are. And, and I'm here with Kurt Melissa, who has actually been on Air Force One mm -hmm. as it's leaving the community. Kurt, give us an idea. What's going on in that jet right now? They are, uh, they are settling in for a long winter's nap, <laughs> as the fable would go, or in this case, or in this case, uh, replaying the event, the president probably uh, having some coffee or an iced tea and some presidential peanuts and M&Ms and some lunch, and just uh, replaying the event. I'm sure he's using this as a vehicle of presidential persuasion, because Kevin, it demonstrably is. He's got the congressman. He needs their votes. He's going back to D.C. Is he meeting with the media right now, going over what happened? I don't think so. That might happen in the last leg, uh, going back to Washington although he will be in Washington, so he could talk to them later okay, as well. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, this is the shot we've been uh, waiting for. He might meet with one or two, but basically this will be a political uh, voyage, hey, and he Kurt, will be talking to the four There goes Air Force One. Let's go back to News 8's Melissa Long. Melissa? Thank you very much, Kevin. Really not much to be said as we watch Air Force One depart Rochester. Known as Air Force One, that's the radio call sign when the president is in this craft, the other 747 in the presidential fleet, or any Air Force aircraft inside right now. As Kurt Smith was saying, probably not much of a debriefing, but I will tell you, it is a massive aircraft, 4,000 square feet with a conference room, medical facility, and many senior offices. I'm sure there was a little bit of meeting today. Again, that's uh, the live report today from the Rochester International Airport. Kevin? Okay, Melissa, thank you very much. Great job as Air Force One flies off into the distance. Uh, I would have to say overall security, the setup, the organization, job well done today. It really is. I mean, the president has limousine one, he has the official helicopter marine one, he's got the official airplane, airplane one. It's his village. This is Armada. It's a movable feast and it goes with him. The president brought that to us today, and I think as the White House looks at this, he, they must think, look, this is a job well done, not simply by them, but more to the point, by all of the people involved on this end as well. Okay, Kurt, thank you very much. So, please, join us tonight for News 8 Now at 5 and 6 o'clock. We'll have a complete team coverage for you of everything that's happened today from the time that Air Force One touched down to the President's speech here at Greece Athena and to the time that Air Force One took off just a couple of moments ago. I'm Kevin Dorn, live at the Greece Athena Performing Arts Center. On behalf of Kurt Smith, thank you for joining us. Wednesday on Wake Up Rochester. A look back at the president's visit. And chic shoes that are cheap, too. Uh, safer and guaranteed effective. Trust only Simple Green. We now join our regularly scheduled program, already in progress. as we move into later tonight and tomorrow for the New England states. While we get a little bit of sunshine, a touch of sun come tomorrow, that'll be welcomed with temperatures 60 to 65 on Wednesday. So today's forecast, near 55, cooler lakeside, but look at those winds. They will subside as we move into the 10 o'clock hour, but we're looking about 53 at 3, 55 at 
7 o'clock. And as we move into the overnight, lows near 45, mostly cloudy and cool. Winds will drop off substantially. But if you're planning the next couple of days, 60 to 65 Wednesday and Thursday, those are the dry days, Donna, yeah. in the short term. But sadly, as we look at Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, Saturday at this point appears to be the soggiest of those four. Monday and Friday, the driest. So trying to plan a cookout, yeah. temperatures generally in the mid-60s. <laughs> Not what you'd like to see, but yeah. there are signs that we could warm up into the 70s, maybe even 80s for the first weekend in June. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, David, for, for being with us here. Good deal. I, wanna, I said thank you, Mark. I want to thank Mark Guerin for, for being with us on our coverage uh, for the, the presidential visit, uh, President Hobart William Smith, but uh, in communications with the Clinton White House and providing a great perspective for us. We really thank enjoyed you. all that you had to say for us. Thank uh, you. It's good to be with you. All right. Also want to thank uh, Doug Ambush and Ginny Ryan, who have been uh, out in the elements all day long. Uh, Doug out at the airport. And uh, Ginny, Doug, any final thoughts watching that plane depart? Doug can't hear me. How I'm about sorry, Gin I can, I can, oh, okay. Don. I was, I was letting Ginny, you asked about the plane. I'm sorry, I apologize. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> the, the thing that struck us both here, Kristen Miranda and I, uh, as we watched all this end, it is over as, you know, it, it took days to prepare mm -hmm. for, and it ends so fast. Take a look. Can we, can we just pan off here? There's the Secret Service snipers that have been on the roof for the president's arrival and the president's departure today. They are the last vestige of the extra security here. All the cars are gone, all the vehicles are gone, the uh, police departments are moving out, just a few sheriffs, to, one sheriff's department unit still left here. But as soon as the president's plane leaves the ground, Don, it is pretty much over in terms of all that buildup that we've been reporting on since last week. And the airport uh, returning to normal, flights should resume fairly shortly, I would assume, at this point? If they haven't already, the airspace yeah. may be open already, Don. All right. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Jenny, some final thoughts out of Athena, where it's been a, a busy day outside, not only with the weather, but with the, with the protesters out there. Yeah, my thoughts quickly are turning inside. Can you imagine trying to be a teacher right now at Greece Athena, trying to settle down the students <laughs> to return to work and school, life is normal? It won't be a typical day. This was not a typical day when yeah. the president comes to visit. But what a great lesson it was for all the students at Greece Athena and the folks who just gathered outside today, took a walk from their homes, grabbed a lawn chair and sat and watched the whole thing unfold. It was interesting to see and the word and the expression we kept hearing over and over again was once in a lifetime yeah. i'm here because it's an opportunity whether you agree or not it's a chance to see some history being made i, I know the day is now when i see our satellite track pass truck pass behind <laughs> you on the way home that, that means everything is wrapped up thank you jenny uh, yes. and doug as well for all of your help with coverage today our thanks to uh, and i don't want to forget anyone but jane flash and the patrice who were both inside greece athena evan dawson was outside Kristen miranda of course who was with doug all of our outstanding uh, staff of reporters and photographers and producers who have made this uh, a memorable event, outstanding coverage of the visit of President George W. Bush. We are blessed too with the editors and photographers behind the scenes here that take events such as today and put them into perspective for us. So we will close now. Thank you for joining us. Reminding you, we will have uh, more complete reports, especially those behind the scene reports at 5 uh, and 6 and 11 o'clock tonight. But we share with you uh, a piece that our, our editor and videographer John Borden has put together, remembering this day, the day that George W. Bush came to Rochester, New York. visit. Stay tuned for continuing coverage on 13WAM News and on 13WAM.com.